So this happened a while back. I was probably around 10 or 11 years old, meaning my brother, we'll call him Alex, was around 8 or 9. We were walking home from the bus, which takes about 7 minutes to do, when I noticed that something was off. I didn't see anything at first, but I definitely just knew that something was wrong. My brother and I start walking home, the only two who got off at our stop were he and I. This blue and silver beat up truck drives past us, and at first I think nothing of it. I mean, it never slowed down or stopped or anything, it just kept right on going. Alex and I were holding hands, as my grandmother had always told me to do that since he was my baby brother and I didn't want him to get lost or anything bad to happen to him. Nothing happened at first, but then I noticed that same truck driving around again, driving our way this time. There was a cul-de-sac at the end of our road. It was driving much slower this time. It went up the road and turned out of sight. By this point, Alex and I were nearing the three-way intersection that connected the cul-de-sac road to the other side road, right off the main one the man had just drove down. I happened to look down the street and see the truck driving extremely slow, back down the street towards us once again. I knew in that moment we had to run. I knew there was no other option. I knew that if we didn't, my brother and I would not be safe. I don't know how I knew this, but I knew it in my heart. As soon as we passed a house that blocked us from view, I turned to Alex and spoke to him exactly four words. No questions, just run. And run we did. In our driveway, which was about a hundred feet long, there was a big row of bushes and pine trees that divided our home from our next door neighbor. I dragged him into the bushes and told him to be quiet and I'd explain everything later. I watched as that same truck drove up and down the cul-de-sac again before coming to a stop right in front of our house. I had to hold my brother's mouth shut because he was crying. I was scared that whoever was following us would hear him and hurt us. Honestly, I was more worried for him than myself at this point. I was in fight or flight mode. I was the big sister and it was my job to protect him. I looked down at him and told him the truck had been following us, but I told him not to be scared. I wouldn't let anyone hurt him. Thankfully, it seemed to calm him down just a little. After what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes, the door to the truck opened, and out hopped a man. He was tall, skinny, and messy. Short hair covered by a torn baseball cap, ripped jean shorts, and a puke green tank top. He entered our yard and looked around a bit. Alex and I were still in the bushes. I was trying to find a way to get to our house safely without alerting this dude's attention. The guy left after what felt like forever and entered his car once more. He started it and began to drive away slowly. I waited a few minutes to make sure he was gone before turning to my brother and saying, We need to run, okay? When I count to three, we're going to run behind the house to the back door. He agreed and we waited a few more seconds before I started counting. I really didn't have a good feeling about this, but I knew we couldn't just wait here forever. I started counting. As soon as I hit three, we booked it across our driveway and into our front yard to go around the house. As soon as we left our spot, I heard it immediately. The sound of accelerating. He'd seen us. He was just waiting for us to leave. He chased us up our driveway as we ran around the side. I grabbed Alex's hand and practically dragged him around the house. I made him run ahead to the garage door to see if it was locked while I searched for my house key. The garage door was open. I swear to God, I saw this man round the opposite corner of the house that we did just as I managed to enter. We entered the door and slammed it shut, locking and deadbolting it as well. I didn't stop running until I opened the main house door and ran downstairs with Alex, screaming our safe word. My grandmother had made a safe word for us that was a normal everyday word we could use if we were in danger. We just had to scream it, basically. It woke up my aunt who worked the night shift and was sleeping. We told her everything and she stayed with us until my grandmother got home. We called the police. 
that was actually my first ever interaction with an officer. The man was never caught, though. To this day, I don't know what he wanted, but I know for sure it was not good. I'm just glad my grandma drilled stranger danger into my head. I don't know where my brother or I would be right now if she hadn't done that. I was about seven years old, my brother about ten or so. It was well past our bedtime when our mom woke up off the couch to put us to bed. Our dad worked construction out of town back then, so it was often just the three of us at the house for weeks at a time. Up the stairs and to the immediate right was our parents' bedroom. Going left put you in the middle of a hallway. Taking another left down that hallway led to my brother's room. The opposite end was my room, which was also across the hall from our upstairs bedroom. At either end of this hallway were these windowed doors that we always kept locked and very rarely used. The door on my end led to a balcony overlooking our front yard. The door on my brother's end opened to our back porch. The house kind of leaned into a small hill if that makes sense. My brother and mom both had a habit of waking up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. I only knew this because I was a very light sleeper, and they just couldn't seem to help flushing with the door wide open. This night, however, my brother stopped on his way to his room and came back toward the bathroom. I'm gonna try to pee before I go to bed this time. The past few nights I've been too afraid to walk to the bathroom. I keep seeing a man wearing stripes at the end of the hallway. I don't know if my mom wrote it off as my brother telling ghost stories to try to scare me, or if she was already just half asleep and didn't catch it, but she didn't react at all to my brother's confession. I, on the other hand, was completely terrified of it. The fear of seeing a ghost like that at the end of the hallway or through the windows was the reason I started running from my stairs to my bedroom at night. Years later, when I was 18, my mom and I were having a conversation in her car about a dog we'd had for a very short time when I was little. We were sharing stories about Max's tendency towards destroying my shoes and other unruly behaviors, when my mom suddenly blurted out, Do you remember that time I opened the front door for the cops and Max ran inside to the kitchen and started tearing open that big bag of dog food we had? This really caught me by surprise, because in all the years I'd lived in that house, we never once called the cops gun owner family in a quiet rural West Virginia neighborhood. You know the deal. I asked her what she was talking about. She looked equally surprised, as if she had just revealed a big secret by accident. Oh, that's right. I never told you because you were too young at the time. I remember one night I woke up hearing noises outside my window. When I looked out, I saw a man staring into my bedroom. She went on to describe how the lights caused him to take off running and how she grabbed my dad's pistol before calling the cops. I can't remember all the details I gave them when they showed up. A tall white male wearing a striped shirt and jeans, I think. Short dark hair, something like that. They said it matched the description of a man they were looking for in the area. I think he had just escaped from jail on a murder charge or something. Now, I know it sounds so obvious, hearing those two stories back to back, but it wasn't until just a few years ago, in my mid-twenties, that I pieced together my brother had unknowingly warned us about a murderer who had spent multiple nights casing our home. I just came back from dinner with my mom, and we talked about something that happened literally 20 years ago, while we did, I thought it might be a good story to share. Now, before I can jump in, I need to sketch the surroundings just a bit. At the time, my mom was 43, and I was 18 years old. Our relation at the time wasn't exactly very good. Admittedly, that was pretty much my fault. I was a very rebellious teenager then, and important for the story, I was caught up in the metal scene at the time among other things being the vocalist of a black metal band. You know, those inhuman screeches, it's actually a real trick. 
Next to that, I had picked up a strong liking for weed. My mom stood out less in both attire and manners. Although, and yes, this is important too, she liked the color blue and had long blonde hair. Behind our own house stood a house owned by Social Services, an organization that provided sheltered living. So there lived three men, Abe, Bart, and Carl. Abe and Bart were obviously in need of help, but completely harmless. Carl... Carl was even in that company something special. Not on first sight. He was a rather diminutive guy who dressed quite well. But well, if people are really, really detached from reality, all you have to do is look into their eyes and you immediately know. Carl might have been heavily medicated, but he was still batshit crazy. I don't know what really was the problem. I'm not a psychiatrist or anything. But in a nutshell, he suffered extreme religious delusions and was convinced that some people were angels, some were demons, and others were characters from the Bible. I did not know that, but in hindsight, let me give you a rundown of how I looked when I returned home from a show. Long hair, a beard, a rather muscular build, a black frock like monks wear, a studded leather belt and arm bracelets, a big pentagram around my neck, and I went full out corpse paint. So, in short, after seeing me walk around like that a few times and hearing the frequent arguments my mom and I had, Carl became convinced I was an actual demon. And here comes the catch. My mom was apparently the Virgin Mary. Blue clothes, long blonde hair, remember? He thought I wanted to abduct her away into hell. But he had his medication and he wasn't a danger to anybody, right? Until on a hot summer day, I got a visit from the police because I had gotten into a fight. So, what did my mom do? She invited the cops to sit in the yard while they talked to me. To Carl, though, that was somehow the straw that broke the camel's back. The cops left, I succeeded in convincing them I just happened to be near the fight, and my mom and I started arguing. At that same moment, Carl made the decision to start skipping his medication. A week later, I had a show in a neighboring city, so around 3 a.m. I return. Because I wasn't that stupid, I didn't drink or smoke before getting in my car. I was planning on doing that afterward, though. In the car were two of my bandmates, Andres and Quentin. I go inside. My mom is fast asleep. I grab a few beers while they sit in the garden. Smoking had to happen outside, and besides, it was pretty hot anyway. We sit chat, smoke, drink, all is great, until Carl takes this opportunity to act. What the fuck? said Andres. He pointed at the hedge at the end of our garden. All three of us, intoxicated by then, watched Carl dressed in a white gown and with an aluminum circle on his head, wrestle himself through the hedge. And what do you think you're doing? I said. Be gone, forces of evil! He shouted, waving at us with a rather large cross, almost as long as my arm actually. At that moment, I'll admit, we had no idea what to do. If you think about it, he probably took that as a sign that his cross had worked. He ran to my open back door, my clue to run behind him, screaming at him to stop. He entered my house, shrieking that he was coming to save the Virgin Mary. Now it gets weird. My mom woke up from all the shouting finally. She wore white PJs and had her hair loose. Carl must have thought she just descended from heaven, so he bolted it up the stairs, fell to his knees and started praying in front of her. The three demons behind him were strangely enough not repelled by this. I grabbed him by a scrawny neck, totally ready to go medieval on him. I mean, we had our problems, sure, but this is my mom we're talking about. He jumped up and wrestled himself free with unimaginable strength and managed to smack Quentin across the head with his cross. Andres and I backed up. We looked at each other and nodded. Now, Carl was going down. Stop! My mom said, as loud as she could. She walked up to Carl and took his hand. I think you're seeing this wrong. He looked up at her and started crying. I mean, ugly bawling. He told her he just wanted to protect her from us. I know, 
I know, but that really isn't necessary. I whispered to Andres to call the cops downstairs, and I stayed there with my mom. Look, he's just a kid that likes to dress himself up. I don't really like it either, but it's just a game. She motioned at me, and I lost my frock, the belt, and all that other stuff. Underneath, I was only wearing my boxers. I wish I had a picture of this moment. Carl was still on his knees crying, my mom standing before him smiling, Quentin sitting against the wall holding his head and bleeding. I was standing in my boxers. I mean, you don't have to be crazy to get confused by all of this. Carl took a deep breath. But you're the Virgin Mary. No, I'm just a nice lady. And they're my son and his friends. And you're Carl. It's all okay. He looked at me and then my mom. He stood up and grabbed his cross. He looked at it and then said in an almost childish voice, Didn't I tell you? He made his way downstairs through the garden, through the hedge, and back to his own place. Somewhat later, the cops showed up. We explained everything, and the very next day, Carl moved out. That was the story about the one man I don't want to meet again, and how I learned that my mom is underneath her appearance brave and smart as fuck. To conclude this, two days later, his social worker paid us a visit, telling us what happened in Carl's mind leading up to that night, repeating over and over how happy they were nobody was harmed. I, by then my usual braggadocious teenage self once again, said, I would have dealt with him. The social worker shook his head. Apparently, Carl didn't only have a cross. He also had a large kitchen knife and several other weapons under his gown as well. This happened to me about a month ago, but it still boggles my mind. Two points of background to make this story make sense. One, I live in Tokyo and commute via those famously crazy crowded trains daily. There exists on them this kind of unspoken agreement that everyone works together to make this suck as little as possible. People, for the most part, hold their backpacks in front of them. Men don't manspread, etc. That's when the trains are full, though. About two stops before mine, the train went from sardine can to everyone on this train could lay on the seats and still have plenty of room left over. Usually, I could just sit down at this point. Two, I'm not a Japanese woman. Very obviously so, even when I'm in my white dress shirt and pencil skirt like all the other office drones. I'm often the only obviously non-Japanese woman on my train in the morning. Despite my appearance, though, I'm quite fluent in Japanese. One day, I sit down when the train empties out, headphones in, mobile game going, ready to enjoy the ten minutes of sitting I get on my hour-long commute. I'm sitting with my legs crossed, but there's maybe ten people in the whole car, so it's not like I was in anyone's way or anything. I had tuned out already, when all of a sudden a hand reached out and grabbed my bare knee. I of course jolted straight out of my skin. I ripped my headphones out and looked up at the hand's owner. It was some skinny old Japanese dude, maybe in his 60s or so. He pointed at my legs and then at the other people on the train. Again, a max of 10 in a car that could hold 50 plus easily and probably had held 80 just 10 minutes ago. In slightly broken English, he said, You must not cross legs. I was so bewildered by this, I started to tell him in Japanese, The train isn't crowded right now, I'm not in anyone's way. He obviously didn't like this answer. He reached for my legs again, and presumably tried to forcibly uncross them himself. I, liking even less of this, summoned my loudest non-scream. Don't touch me! Thankfully, this was enough to get him to back off. Another thing you didn't do on trains like these was make a fuss. Sadly though, yet another thing you don't do here is get involved. So despite a woman all but screaming, don't touch me, it's obviously some foreign woman causing trouble. Best not to get involved, etc, etc. So no one comes over to help either. I've made it clear that I will not stand for physical confrontation. This old dude felt comfortable enough to stand directly in front of me, nearly knee to knee, and loom over me while he repeated endlessly, 
You must. He did this for at least five minutes. I didn't move. I didn't blink or break eye contact. I started plans B through P of how to get off this train at the next stop. Thankfully, he gave up before then, shaking his head and calling me a rude bitch in Japanese before wandering off. I still take that same train to work, but I haven't seen him ever since. I hope I don't ever meet this leg police fucker ever again, lest he find out what happens when you loom over a girl at dick punting height. This all happened yesterday. I'm writing this on my phone from our motel room, so please forgive any errors. Here we go. Fort Bragg, California is a small beach town northwest of Sacramento. It has kind of a Stephen King feel to it. You know what I mean. It's misty, almost kind of an eerily small harbor town. It's beautiful though and a very big tourist attraction as well. You get people from all over the U.S. that travel here. My fiancé and I decided to drive up here after I had to take some time off work due to stress. It was a very last-minute decision. We packed up our bags in less than 10 minutes, grabbed our dog, and took off. If we wouldn't have had our dog with us, I'm pretty sure I would have lost her. I guess this is the part where I tell the story, right? It's our second day here right now and we're staying at a motel that overlooks the ocean. You can see the fog roll in during the early hours of the morning and watch the fishing boats leave the harbor to go get their haul for the day. It's a really stunning thing to see. We woke up quite early, and I was craving, and I mean absolutely craving, eggs and bacon. After getting dressed and deciding what spot to stuff our faces at, we left on our morning adventure. See, here's where I'd made my mistake. I was driving down the road, and it looked like the stop we crawled up to was a four-way stop sign. I guessed wrong because when I pulled out and cut off a small Ford Ranger with a dinky trailer attached to it and two old men driving, I realized a little bit too late that I'd just cut them off. They threw up their hands and pointed at me, but Lily didn't even seem to notice it. I threw up my hands in a sorry I'm just a dipshit tourist kind of way. They just stared me down. It was a hillbilly standoff George Strait would be proud of. I didn't really think too much of it though. Instead, I kept driving down the foggy two-lane road to go get breakfast. I didn't even think to say anything to her about it. I never thought I'd see them again. And I didn't want her to complain about me not knowing how to drive. I was wrong though. I was so wrong and I'll never forget what happened next. We went back to the motel after a not-so-great but overly expensive breakfast. We cuddled up and talked about our plans for the future and what we wanted to do in life. Midway through our conversation, though, she realized we were out of dog food to feed Bruce. I agreed to go down to the cute but very creepy market nearby and grab a bag of goodies. I kissed her on the cheek and jumped in the navvy. We called our navigator Navi. I left and had gotten about halfway to the store before I realized I'd forgotten my wallet on the nightstand. When I pulled back into the parking lot, I saw it. That same Ford Ranger with the janky trailer still attached to it. The only difference was that Hank and Boomhauer weren't inside of it this time. That's strange. I don't remember seeing them here last night, I thought. I walked up to our door while looking over my shoulder wondering, what are the chances these douchebags are staying here? Not two seconds later, my heart started beating faster. Our motel door was open, but barely cracked. It was open slightly to the point where you could see just a sliver of light but nothing more. I slowly pushed it open and looked inside, but I didn't see anything. Lily and Bruce were both gone. It was like they were never even there at all. My heart started racing. I dropped my keys on the floor and ran outside, heart pounding in my chest faster than a jackhammer in New York. I didn't see those creepy old guys from the Ford truck or Lily outside. I was becoming angry and frantic at this point. Fuck. Fuck. Where are you guys at? I thought before the screaming inside my head was cut off by the sound of familiar barking. I heard Bruce barking and I ran. 
I ran faster than I ever have in my entire 28 years of life. I ran straight over to the front office, where the sound was coming from. That's when I saw her and our dog inside. She was crying, sitting on the floor, sobbing uncontrollably. His hair was standing straight up until he saw it was me sprinting towards them. Lily got up and ran into my arms. Meanwhile, the clerk was on the phone. I was wondering what the fuck happened in those two minutes I was gone. This is what she told me happened, and it makes my blood run cold. Turns out as soon as I left, not 30 seconds went by when those inbred assholes knocked on the door. Lily opened it up thinking it was me for getting my wallet, which I did. They tried to force their way into the room saying, you can thank your boy toy for what's coming to you. They grabbed her and covered her mouth, but those assholes didn't realize one thing. We had a dog in our back seat when I cut them off. Bruce jumped off the bed and didn't hesitate to bite the one grabbing her. They kicked him and tried to shake him off, but he wouldn't let go. After being bit and realizing the noise would draw attention if they didn't leave, they ran off, and Lily was able to sprint to the front office and wait for help while Bruce followed suit. I wasn't there. I couldn't protect her. If we would have found a dog sitter and our plans weren't last minute, she could be gone right now. But my dog was there, and he did exactly what a good boy, no, the best boy would do. And for that, he's truly my best friend. If he wasn't there, what could have happened? Would she have been kidnapped, beaten, killed, all of the above? The craziest thing is that they haven't even been caught yet. We filed all the reports with the local sheriff. I told them what happened earlier that morning, and the cop looked right at me and said, You're lucky your dog was there. If he wasn't and they got in there with her, you could have been filing a very different report right now. I got tears in my eyes at that. I looked over at Lily and Bruce and thank God I rescued him from the pound, because in return he rescued the love of my life when I wasn't there. So last night, I was at a classmate's house, working on a group project we have due tomorrow. I live in an apartment in the town where our university is located. My classmate lives at his parents' house, which is in the foothills just outside of town. In order to get to the house, you have to drive along a relatively secluded and narrow two-lane road for about five or six miles. We started working on the project at about 6 p.m., and I ended up hanging around for a while after we had finished our working. I left his house pretty late, at about 11 or so, and started down the road back towards town. I didn't quite realize how tough it would be though to navigate this road at night. There were no streetlights and the road was completely unkempt and riddled with potholes. On top of this, I had no cell service either, so I had to drive very slowly to make sure I didn't blow out one of my tires since I had just used my spare a couple of weeks back. I figure I was about three miles from the house when I rounded a tight corner and saw a pickup truck with a camper shell parked diagonally across the road. The manner in which it was parked completely impeded my path forward, and I couldn't drive around it either. There was a gully on both sides of the road. The only way for me to go at this point was backward, where there was a pull-off that I could use to turn my car around. At first, I couldn't see inside the cab, but when I turned on my high beams, I saw there was a man slouched over in the driver's seat, his head resting against the steering wheel as if he had just been knocked out by a very bad accident. I immediately sensed that something was wrong here, the way his car had just coincidentally come to rest in a position that totally blocked off the road was a big red flag for me. I had heard stories before of people playing dead in the road as a way to lure unsuspecting people out of their cars so they could try and rob them. I decided, fuck this shit. I elected to go back to my classmate's house and explain exactly what was going on. I threw the car into reverse and kept my eyes darting back and forth between my rear view and that truck. I looked and saw that I was almost at the pull-off where I could turn around finally. When I looked back at that truck, my heart skipped about five beats. The man who had just moments ago been slouched over in the driver's seat 
was now sprinting at my car at a hurried pace, while a few other men jumped out of the camper shell and started moving towards me as well. I panicked and accelerated backwards into the pull-off, which messed up the undercarriage of my car pretty bad. As I put it into drive, the guy had already reached my passenger side door and was tugging on the handle. Thank the Lord I had remembered to lock it. I only got a brief glimpse of him, but his face appeared to be scabbed and leathery. Definitely a meth head or some sort of drug abuser. I sped away and didn't slow down at all until I reached the house, constantly checking my rear view to see if they were following. Thankfully, they didn't tell me, and when I reached the house, I explained what had happened to my classmate. We called the cops together. I was extremely grateful my buddy's parents were kind enough to let me stay that night. They didn't find anyone on the road matching the description, but I filed an incident report. They told me they would be on the lookout for similar vehicles and suspicious activity. But holy shit, I'm still so shaken up over it. I kept getting the same adrenaline rush I got when I saw the guy charging me whenever I think about it. Please share any similar experiences you've had. I would appreciate a good reader discussion to help me clear my headspace on this incident. To put this into context, I'm an 18-year-old girl living in New Zealand. I suffer from anxiety and shut down in stressful situations. I tend to become rather overwhelmed when I'm not sure how to deal with something. This story happened yesterday, whilst I was waiting at my bus station to catch a ride home. I'd had a very long day at work, and my legs were very much in pain. All I wanted to do was get home and watch some YouTube or read something in bed or something. It was getting quite dark and the sun was almost completely down. As I was listening to some music in a rather deserted area of the bus station, a man considerably larger than myself sauntered up and sat down directly next to me on the bench. I didn't really think much of this at first. To put this into perspective, I'm roughly 55 kilograms. He must have been at least 100 and could have very easily overpowered me. I noticed out of the corner of my eye that this man was staring at me. I began to feel a little bit uncomfortable and pegged it up to maybe him looking at my mask or something. It was rather nondescript and just black. I ignored this and acted busy on my phone to avoid conversation. As I said, I'd had a long day at work and would rather not be bothered. The man began to talk to me, and I pulled out my AirPod to listen to what he was saying to me. The AirPod fell and landed on the ground, which he picked up for me. He held onto it and stared at it for a few moments, before handing it back to me. I was already starting to get bad vibes from this man. The conversation went something like this. Your eyes are so beautiful. Did you get them from your mom or your dad? Uh, I don't know, my mom, I guess. I kept my replies short to signify I wasn't in the mood for talking, but he continued nonetheless. What bus are you catching? Where do you live? I laughed nervously and told him I didn't feel very comfortable sharing that information. I told him it was farther up north. Completely unprompted, he then said, Why? It's not like I'm going to rape you. Isn't it really fancy up there? This is where I began to feel seriously uncomfortable and began to shake. He asked if I had a boyfriend, to which I said yes. He proceeded to ask if I planned to marry him, to which I laughed and said yes again. Oh, it kind of sounds like you're just rooting him. Are you sure you want that? I was shocked and looked at him again. Yes, I do plan to marry my partner. What business is it of yours? How old are you? I don't know what came over me, but I told him I was 21 to make it come across I was old enough to stand up for myself. Are you on the pill? Do you use condoms instead? I wanted to walk away, but I was grounded to that bench and couldn't move a muscle if I tried. I was uncomfortable and confused as to why he was getting so close to me. Do you have someone waiting for you at the bus stop or are you walking home? How far do you live? This is the question that made everything click into place and I realized this guy definitely had malicious intent. He was not being friendly. This man was going to follow me home and either rape me or kidnap me. I started to really panic 
and started desperately looking for onlookers. A young man, possibly my age, walked out of the public restroom. He had overheard this conversation and was looking at the predator rather skeptically. I knew then I'd at least have someone to help if I just asked for it. In the moment, though, I didn't. By this point, though, I recalled a video from r slash about a highly pregnant woman and her daughter being followed to their car in an empty car park in the dark by an older man. This lady was stressfully trying to find her keys in her purse as this man was standing beside her daughters on the opposite side of the car, making small talk with them. I remember someone commented on this submission saying it was a popular thing that he was waiting for her to unlock the car so he could get in and control her via threats to her children. It occurred to me that maybe I could skip my bus and catch another one instead. I did this exactly. He kept trying to ask where I lived and I kept refusing to tell him where. He also continued to ask how far I lived from the stop and if anyone was waiting for me. I deflected all of his questions and after 40 minutes he began to get grumpy and walked away from the station. He wasn't there to catch a bus at all, but to prey on young women at the bus stop. I caught my bus when it arrived a few minutes after he left. I ran home, where I completely broke down and cried in the arms of my partner. This morning I was so stressed I contemplated taking the day off work and staying in bed for the rest of it to cry. I was petrified. In the end though, I still ended up going and I'm at work sharing this story. This just happened tonight, so this shit is fresh, and I'm freaked out and honestly quite pissed off. I, 23 and female, met Jason, 23 and male, from an app online last September. We clicked almost immediately, and from then on we went out together about once a week, maybe sometimes twice. We've spent the past year or so going on dates, out to nice restaurants, garden walks, spending the night. We established that we had feelings for each other about two months into everything, though we did have our rocky moments, and I didn't fully trust him. At one point I wanted to date, but he claimed he was too busy with work which subsequently caused us to separate for a while. Once we eventually came back together, I told him I didn't necessarily need to be exclusive, but we could still hang out as I enjoyed his company. Now, there was always some sneaking suspicions that there was another partner in his life, because he always paid in cash wherever we went and was very secretive about his private life as well. I had voiced these thoughts to him, but honestly didn't care too much because after he told me he wasn't interested in dating me, I also started seeing another partner. I was using protection with both of them anyway. Meanwhile, he said he didn't want to date me but raged whenever he thought there was another man around my life. He had exhibited some concerning and possessive behaviors, but I let them slide for the most part because I was still doing whatever I wanted. Fast forward to tonight. November 19th, 2019, 14 months after we first met. We went to a really nice restaurant downtown after work. I asked if he wanted to take the subway back to my place, since we'd had a few drinks. We stopped by his car to grab his bag and went off to the station. When we got there, he said he'd forgotten his card in his car. I figured it was no biggie and swiped for him instead. I said he didn't need to pay me back because it was like two dollars, but he insisted he would Venmo me. When we got to my apartment, I told him he was welcome to take a shower and he went to the bathroom. I was messing around on my phone when I saw CS had sent me two dollars for the train. This was quite weird to me because his initials were JN, so I clicked on his Venmo friends list. He only had around 20 so I picked a random person and looked them up on Facebook. I went down on their friends list and would you look at that? A picture of Jason and his brother. The only issue was his name was not Jason. It was Chase Smith. The photo looked a bit different as well because he was 50 or 60 pounds heavier in the photograph and was currently very fit. I'm 90% sure it was him though. Just to confirm this, I googled his name and the area around which he lives, and I got a hit on the white pages. It said he was related to Velma and Shaggy Smith, 
and I remembered him once telling me his siblings had those exact names. It turned out I didn't even know the name of this guy. He got out of the shower and sat down on my bed. I was quiet and looked at his face. Is your real name Chase Smith? This motherfucker looked me dead in the eye and said, No. You guys, I lost it. I must have made that leave Brittany alone guy look calm and collected. I started crying, telling him to get the fuck out of my house. He approached me and I told him not to touch me, but he grabbed my wrist tightly and insisted we had to talk about it. I told him again to get the fuck out and never contact me again. He refused to leave for a while, but eventually I was able to break free of him and force him out. Afterward, I looked a little bit deeper and found out he has criminal records, though I can't see what they're for at the moment. From his past behavior, I'm honestly a little bit worried for my safety. I immediately blocked him on everything, and I know for a fact he's going to go apeshit when he realizes he can't contact me. Everything has been a lie. When you think you know someone, it turns out they're probably crazy. Admittedly, it's a little bit funny because what the fuck. But I'm also getting some serious you vibes, and I'm not quite ready to die yet, you know? It'd be real cool if this guy never came around again. Update. My sister has continued to sleuth. Turns out today he slightly changed the spelling of his last name on Facebook, probably to deter others he's been messing around with from finding his profile. He doesn't know that I still found him though, and doesn't realize the spelling of his last name wasn't really relevant in the process either. This dude is an actual psycho, who's probably doing this to multiple women. I'm more afraid for them than myself, because they clearly don't know this is going on, if he's taking further steps to hide himself. I wish I knew who they were so I could somehow reach out and warn them. One day, when I was an elementary schooler, I think probably in third or fourth grade at the time, I was awoken by my mom in a big rush. It turned out she had overslept, and since she always woke me up in the morning, this meant that I too overslept. Now there was just no way I was going to be ready for school early enough to catch the bus. If I recall correctly, school started at 8am, and my bus pickup time was around 7 it was already 6.40 or so, and I was still in my pajamas and hadn't even had breakfast yet. My mom decided that because of this, today we would tell the bus driver to just go ahead without me, and she would take me to school instead. This would at least give me plenty of time to get ready. I'm sitting there at the dining room table eating breakfast, still in my PJs. It was now about 6.50. We hear the bus pull right up alongside our house, about 10 minutes earlier than usual. My mom peeks her head out the door, into the foggy morning, and waves at the bus. She closes the door and comes back inside, but the bus doesn't pull away. Instead, after a few moments, there's a knock at the door. My mom opens it, to find a man standing there in a bus driver uniform. He explained that he was a substitute driver, because the regular driver had called in sick that day. He apologized and said he knew he was a few minutes early, but he wanted to get an early start on the route since he didn't know it very well yet. My mom explained to him that she was going to take me to school instead, since we had woken up late that day. At these words, he got visibly upset and said that he could wait a few minutes since he was already running ahead of schedule. My mom insisted though, saying I wouldn't be ready to go in just a few minutes. She told him to go on ahead instead. The man got very angry about this, but eventually turned around and got back in the bus and left. After that, I just returned to eating my breakfast. I still didn't even have my school clothes on at this point. At 7am sharp though, another bus pulled up alongside my house. My mom thought this was weird of course, and went outside to talk to them directly. She came back in looking terrified, but didn't say anything about it. Instead, she told me to hurry and finish getting ready for school. At the time, I really had no idea what had happened, but my mom would end up telling me everything a few years later. When she had gone to this second bus, she found that it was actually being driven by my regular bus driver, 
and it was also full of all the other kids that were usually on the route. The other bus had been empty, by the way. My mom asked the driver about the substitute and about him calling in sick that day. I never called in sick. There's no substitute driver on my route, he said. The driver immediately called dispatch in a panic and told my mom to go inside and call the police, which she did without me knowing. They both reported this incident. There was absolutely no one doing my driver's route that day. Whoever this was was most likely a kidnapper who targeted me specifically. I never heard anything about it again either. Not even if anyone else had ended up being picked up by this mysterious fake bus driver. But chances are, had I actually gotten on that bus, I would have never made it to school, or even back home ever again. If my mom hadn't overslept on that specific day, I would have gotten on that bus like usual and never been heard from again. It was 2012, and my best friend Hannah had just convinced me to join her on a weekend trip up north. She had, after searching for the longest time, finally found her dream car and was planning on traveling the 900 kilometers to the very north of Sweden to buy it. It was a second-hand two-door Suzuki Vitara in a purplish kind of color and, I must admit, I didn't really share her obsession with it. With her being the closest thing to a sister that I'll ever get though, I was all too happy to join her on the journey nonetheless. Anna and I have always had each other, ever since the cradle and onwards. Sharing each other's love for adventure, we've traveled all around the world together. At the time this happened, we were both 21, and had just recently returned from a trip in Asia. The man who was selling her this car had agreed to meet us at the small airport in Umea. When we arrived shortly before lunchtime, it had started to snow heavily already. The very first snow of the season, no less. The parking lot was almost empty, and when I saw the man standing outside the Vitara, I felt immediately concerned. He was dressed a lot like a hunter. A lot of people in this area of the country lived a lifestyle with hunting and fishing, so there was nothing really strange about that. Still, though, there was something off about him that made me uneasy. I just couldn't quite put my finger on it. He was nice enough at first smiling and waving to us, shaking hands very firmly with both of us before walking us around this car and pointing out all the tiny little flaws it had. He showed us the work he had done on the car, showed the paperwork from the recently done engine repairs, and made the impression that he didn't want to hide anything about it. On the contrary, he made a grand show about being very forthcoming and honest. The snowing had now intensified, and we were getting very cold. He opened the car door for us, and said, I've got the paperwork at home. Why don't we close the deal over some coffee? Against all my screaming instincts, I climbed in after Hannah, both of us now trapped in the back seat. I had no reason to feel threatened by this man who had been nothing but pleasant to us, other than these strange alarm bells going off inside my head. After the time we'd spent with him, I still couldn't quite tell what it was that made me feel that way but I knew there must have been some sign that something was wrong. Something my subconscious had tuned into, maybe. The man was constantly talking. Funny, since people from north of Scandinavia are famous for never speaking a word more than absolutely necessary. He showed off the stereo as we drove, told us about the various features of the car, about the places we drove past, and about the wildlife and the nature as well. There was not a single silent moment. After about 20 minutes, though, I started to notice that we were in no way moving toward the direction of civilization. Instead, we seemed to be driving further and further into the vast snowing wilderness. It then struck me that he had us in the back of a two-door car, driving us into unknown territory, and no one knew where we were. I looked at Hannah, who was happily listening to the man tell stories about the area, and I noticed she didn't look all too worried. Maybe I was just overreacting. We drove past a group of people standing by the side of the road, hunters planning their day or taking a break, maybe. This truly was a very different Sweden compared to the city. 
and the car finally came to a stop outside a small wooden cottage with no neighboring houses, apart from a small cabin we'd driven past a few hundred meters down the road. That looked long abandoned, though. As we followed the man inside, he was still talking nonstop, and continued to do so until the very moment the door closed behind us. Hannah kept asking things about the car, and I could sense that her voice had a new undertone now, a thin, sharp tenseness that made me wonder if she too had started to feel that something wasn't right here. Ah, let me put the kettle on, he said as he passed us to go into the kitchen. He let his hand touch Hannah's hair and smiled very smugly. Uh, may I use the restroom? I asked politely, and made my way to the door with the little red heart on it. As I was washing my hands, I saw something in the stained bathroom mirror. Something hidden behind the water cistern. I pulled out this rolled up plastic folder, and as I turned the pages, I felt my blood run cold. There were very violent porn pictures that looked like they had all been snipped out of magazines. They were glued all over the paper, surrounded by cut-out pieces of handwritten text. All put together, it made out a horrifying story about how a woman was lured into a car with the promise of getting to buy it cheaply, and then quickly turned into a horror story. I know this will sound silly, but when we traveled together, Anna and I had a special code word for whenever we felt it was time to get out of the situation. Up until this point, we had never needed to use it. We just joked about it. But now, it came in very handy. I walked out of the bathroom, looked directly at Hannah, and said, Potatoes! We forgot to buy potatoes! That's too bad, because good God do we need some! The look on my face must have told her the situation was no joke. Oh, shall we get some as soon as possible then? The sooner, the better, I replied. Hannah, always pretty and charming and capable of some very great acting, casually walked over to the man in the kitchen and tapped on his shoulder. Excuse me, but I was wondering if I could go have a quick look at the cam belt if possible. He huffed something about it being in good shape and handed over the keys. We hopped into the car and sped off faster than the weather strictly speaking allowed. We left that car at the airport and hoped we hadn't made a terrible mistake. What if he had reported it stolen? It would be very embarrassing to explain to the police. But that didn't happen. He didn't follow us, and he never reported it missing either. We had to take the train since we had no plane tickets. The original plan had been to take the car home. We didn't want to linger too close to the airport in case he came looking for us there. Later, Hannah asked me what made me use the code word, and I told her about what I had found. Maybe it was just his fantasy, a sick game, and he would have never done anything to us. But right then and there, I was convinced we would die if we didn't get out of there. Thank God Hannah didn't need any convincing or proof, just that special code word. I truly think that if we hadn't talked about it so many times before, and about how we would handle a situation where we would need it, things would have ended very differently. Both of us knew that if either of us ever used the code word, it was time to get out. No questions asked, and I'm very thankful for that. So this happened in 2013, and I was 17 at the time. My family was looking at this house when the owner showed up and talked to my parents. He seemed like a very nice older man. He told us he had built the house himself. It was a pretty nice two-story house overlooking a river. Anyway, I was standing back watching everyone talk, as the owner was talking and laughing. There was a break in the conversation where he turned away from my parents, and his expression completely and instantly changed from being happy to the most sinister and hateful scowl I had ever seen. I don't think the old man had actually noticed me watching him though. It probably appeared that I was on my phone as my head was down in that moment. As soon as he turned back to them, he instantly went back to smiling. That instant change was so creepy and honestly, it made me feel a little bit sick. I told my mom about what I had seen after he left, but she said it was a little bit weird, but maybe he was just awkward or something. We ended up buying the house in the end. We moved in, and the very next weekend, my family was going to church. 
I didn't feel like going though, so they left me at home all alone. I'm sitting there Sunday morning at about 11 a.m. when I hear this really loud banging outside. It was very rhythmic and was coming from the side of the house as well. I was on the other side on the second floor. Honestly, my dumbass thought maybe it was the wind blowing branches or something. It was a very stormy day outside that day. This meant I kind of brushed it off at first. It stopped after about five minutes. Ten minutes later, though, I could hear walking around downstairs, chairs being moved, kitchen cabinets opening, and the fridge being opened as well. I immediately quietly went to lock my door, grab my baseball bat, and call 911. I told them my address and I texted my mom to tell her that someone was in the house and I'd call the police. At that point, the 911 operator said that someone was 10 minutes out. I told her to be quiet because I could hear the steps coming up toward the stairs. The house was so thin that I could track where he was by hearing his footsteps. At this time, my mom responded she was on her way home. She was 30 minutes away though. So here's a 17-year-old 5'2", 100-pound girl, hunkered in her room, knowing full well that if this person came in, they'd overpower me easily and take the bat from me. I was terrified. I could hear the person walking down the hallway toward my door. I saw them turn the handle and stop. It was locked. I heard that person standing there. They didn't move a single inch. I could hear their breathing through the door. It felt like forever, but I really think it was only about 10 seconds. I heard him swiftly turn around and head back down. I heard the back door open and shut, and about three minutes later the police pulled up. The 911 operator asked me if I could let them in, or if they needed to force it open. I let them know he had just left, so I let them in. No one was there, no sign of forced entry, nothing. When my mom got there, she looked at my stepdad and asked if he had changed the locks. It turned out he had forgotten. I think the creepiest part and what really validated my story was that my mom had just vacuumed the hallway. When I stepped out, I could see shoot prints that were larger than anyone in our household, and the police had not been in that area yet. The steps stopped just outside my room. The old man died about a year after that though, and there were no further problems. This just goes to show that whenever you enter a new abode, you should never forget to change your locks. I was around 16 at the time of this happening. Firstly, I'd like to explain what type of person I am, so my actions make a bit more sense. I'm an average looking girl a bit overweight, which for my country makes me really undesirable. For this reason, I'm not used to males hitting on me, or even considered it a possible occurrence back then. You could say I was usually the man in our group. You know, the girl that looks after every other friend when they're drinking, and if a guy is being rude or harassing someone, I'm the one to shut him down. I don't know why I took on this role. Probably because most of my friends are way too naive and nice. Well, I'm also like that to strangers when I'm alone as well. I always try my best to be helpful to people if they look confused or ask me for directions or anything else. On this particular night, I was going home from school. My high school was in the city center, and I took the bus home usually. Since the buses can get very overcrowded during peak hours, and I really hate being between crowds of people, I normally wait around 30 minutes to an hour to catch the next one. This night, I walked all the way to another bus stop, around five stops before the one to my school. I just wanted to kill some time so I could catch an empty bus. It was quite dark, and I was the only one at that stop. I usually don't have a problem with going out alone late at night. I'm not one of those people that have those men, bad, assault mentalities drilled into me. I'm just sitting there minding my own business, when this 40 to 50 year old man suddenly comes up to me. He had a very friendly face and a big smile as well, so I didn't think anything of it at first. He asked me something, and that's when I realized he was apparently Turkish. I told him I couldn't understand what he was saying, so he began to use basic Bulgarian words he knew. 
I could somehow get the gist that he was asking for directions. Of course, I tried my best to explain, and after I felt like he understood at least a little, I expected him to stop talking to me. But no. He came and sat disturbingly close to me, and started talking to me once more in Turkish. I tried to politely ignore him as best as I could while nodding my head with a smile, looking at the timetable for the next bus. For some reason, this guy started asking me for my phone number. At this moment, I realized this was definitely not only a lost foreigner. I tried to shut this down immediately by saying I didn't even have a phone. Don't ask why I thought that was going to work. I just did in that moment. Finally, I gave in and gave him some random number. He said something else to me again in a language I couldn't understand. And then the worst happened. All this time, I was looking at the one minute until the bus would be arriving. I was praying for him to please not call that number in that time. Of course he did. He shoved his phone in my face and asked why it wasn't ringing. My stomach flipped. I tried to think of something real fast. I remembered that I had my old Motorola in my bag. I usually brought it to school to give to teachers, who collected phones during class. I liked playing games on it as well. This was 2014, so yeah. Fortunately, the battery for this phone was dead, so I pretended this was the reason the call was not going through. I could see this guy wanted to argue with me, but at this moment the bus came and I hopped on. I sat in the seat behind the driver as always. After 10 minutes I got this weird feeling though. I don't know what it was, but suddenly I felt like I was being watched. I looked around, but since I was in the front seat I couldn't exactly see everything on the bus. Luckily our buses had the gigantic mirror on the inside that showed the back. I look into that and I can clearly see him there, sitting in the last seat, his legs barely visible. I started to panic. I was not sure if he was following me, but I was also a very cautious person, so this wasn't exactly something I could ignore. I started checking for him at every stop, and sure enough he was still there. I started to get paranoid. I said fuck it and hopped off the bus. The stop was at our local mall. Luckily it was open until 10 p.m., I decided to go inside, and if he followed, I'd try to sneak out with the crowd. He followed all right. You have to understand that in my town, almost nobody goes out after 9pm. The mall was near empty. I looked around thinking of ways to disappear on him, but there was just no way and no one around either. The mall was a big open space with three floors, almost completely a ghost town. I'd easily be spotted anywhere. Now, you'll probably say you should have asked security for help or something. No. I'm in Bulgaria. We don't do that here. That literally never even went through my mind. Security is probably just some old grandpa that walks around all day. They don't actually do work or anything. If it were today, I might not be as stupid. But back then, it wasn't even an option. Besides, the security was nowhere to be seen. I did the most logical thing I could do. I decided to utilize the knowledge I had acquired in the previous week. You see, the mall had a cool corridor system behind the stores. It was completely unmarked by any signs, and if you didn't know where you were going, you would definitely get lost. It was just endless white corridors that led to countless empty rooms for storage and other random things. Me, being an avid explorer and anime fan, Loved going around on these corridors and pretending to be a ninja from Naruto on a mission. The things 16-year-olds get up to, am I right? I can proudly say I'd learned the correct path to the back stairway of the mall. Because I was smart and obsessed with the idea of being a spy, I decided to lure this creepy guy into the corridors and go out from the back end of the mall. I firstly entered H&M and pretended to look around, just to see if he really was stalking me. He didn't even try to hide it though. He stood outside the store just staring in. I got really scared for a moment. Then I remembered though that I was the best 007 agent out there and continued to walk around the mall. I finally slipped into the corridors and at this point I booked the path to the staircase. I ran out and didn't stop running for two full bus stops. I tried looking back but he was not there. 
Probably he'd gotten lost in those corridors. I proudly decided that I was the greatest hero of all time and went home very proud. Today, being a 21-year-old grown-up, I think about how stupid that is. How I'd probably be 10 times as scared today than I was back then. I hope it never comes to that, though. I have a lot of creepy things that have happened to me, so someday I might get around to writing the rest. I was watching my daughter's kids while she and her husband went out of town. They had a teenage daughter. Let's say her name is Alyssa. At about 3 a.m., I was woken up by this weird rustling sound and looked out the window to see some movement. I could see a boy emerging from the bushes on the side of the house. I saw a bike tossed on the lawn that definitely was not ours as well. My first thought was that it was a burglar casing houses, but since he looked so young and came through on a bike, I figured scaring him straight would be enough for him to decide to head home on his own. I didn't want to ruin a teenager's life by calling the cops right away. I went out onto the porch, flipped the lights on, and said, Can I help you? In my classroom voice. The guy looked very surprised to see me, but not particularly nervous or anything. He was wearing a Letterman-style jacket, but once I got a clear view of him in the streetlights, he seemed much older than my granddaughter, gruff, and more wiry than athletic. He walked up closer to the house and said, Yeah, actually, I'm uh, looking for Alyssa. I gave him a disapproving glare, hoping he'd realized he came looking for a girl late at night, and a grumpy old person had answered. Now was the time to split. I was thinking what must have happened is Alyssa knew her parents were going out of town, and maybe before she knew I'd be staying over, I told a secret older boyfriend to come over while they were gone or something. It was quite late and I was alone with several kids, so I didn't want him coming any closer to the home. I also thought it was a bit weird he'd come so late. I wanted to be sure Alyssa actually wanted to talk to him. I'm sorry, who are you talking about? He said, Alyssa, you know, Alyssa, last name. This is her house, right? I thought since he knew her full name, they must at least be friends. You wait here. He started to walk up and I felt a sick burning in my gut. My instinct kicked in. Stop where you are! Freeze! I then readjusted and said, You stay right there. This is private property, so don't take a single step closer. I went in, and Alyssa was sound asleep, just one room over from where the rustling first occurred. I woke her up and said something to the effect of, I don't know what the big idea was to have friends over this time of night, but you need to tell them to go home. She had no clue what I was talking about. I told her, there's a guy outside asking for you. Confused, she got up and went to the window. She saw him and went as white as a sheet. That guy asked for me? Yeah. By name? Yes. Call the police. I've never seen that guy before in my life. I called 911 immediately, but as I was on the phone with them, Alyssa started tugging at my arm. He's coming up! I had younger kids in the house to think about, so I kept the door latched and pulled it open just enough to yell. I asked my husband and none of us know an Alyssa last name. Leave my property or I'm calling the police! He got angry and started screaming for her to come out. Thankfully, the police came pretty quickly and when he heard the sirens, he grabbed the bike and took off. I watched where he was running to. He jumped into the passenger side of a car without headlights or front plates and sped off. The police followed in the same direction once I pointed them, but they didn't catch him in the end. They advised us to take all her social media details offline if she was sure she didn't know this person. They said they'd had a couple similar reports recently and were currently looking into it. I got a heavy-duty lock after that, and slept in my room for the remainder of my visit. It's been months since this happened, but it was on my mind today, and I can't believe I didn't share it sooner. Back in the winter, I had returned home to New York City, 
and was getting used to the usual schlep on the subway to get to and from work around the city in general. I hate the subway as an overarching sentiment toward the MTA. I had always called it the bane of my existence because it challenged me in all the areas I'm very sensitive about. Close proximity to strangers, claustrophobic spaces, temperature extremes, mysteriously foul smells, pests, and various vermin as well. Overall, it was convenient and tolerable on a good day, but I still had my fair share of unfortunate encounters over the years. That led me to regard the subway as a less than ideal mode of transportation around the city. This one particular early evening on a Sunday solidified my thinking. I had just left a breast cancer fundraiser event around 7 p.m. and was only going a few stops over to where my house was on the end train. My little sister and I sat chatting quietly as the train began to move. A medium-billed black man with a gray pea coat and a beanie made eye contact with me and hurried over to us. He bent down real close to my face, extending his arm out for a handshake. Hello there, you're very beautiful. How you doing? What's your name? I sort of recoiled back, giving him a confused, what are you doing all up in my personal space kind of look. I shook my head in clear disinterest to make his acquaintance. All of a sudden, it was like a switch flipped, and his previously sweet tone turned immediately into ugly rage. You fucking bitch, you think you're better than everybody? You ain't shit, you ugly bitch. You clown ass whore, fuck out of here, you clown ass bitch. He screamed at the top of his lungs. I noticed everyone turning and staring in our direction. Fuck you anyway. He made a waving off gesture while I kinda just sat there staring at him, wide-eyed and wondering what he was going to do next. His entire stance was very aggressive. He stopped screaming, and to my surprise made a direct pass to try the exact same thing on my sister, who was sitting right next to me. Wow, you're so beautiful too. Can I shake your hand? He reached directly over me to touch her. The fucking nerve. I extended my arm. Hey, you leave my sister alone and back the fuck out of our space. The guy smacked my hand out of the way. Now he'd fully pushed my buttons. I stood up and realized I was about eye level with him. He must have been about 5 foot 9, maybe 5 foot 11 at most. Don't fucking touch my sister. I was officially heated now. This part is a blur. I don't remember what he said as he pushed me and we began to scuffle, but I remember landing a very sweet uppercut right on his jaw. This enraged him, of course. He had me on my back within seconds kicking me and screaming. I will fucking kill you! After what felt like an eternity, two good Samaritans of the subway ran up behind him and grabbed him off of me. I could hear one guy shouting at him. Leave her alone, dude! What is wrong with you? When I looked up, I saw several horrified passengers staring at us as we engaged in a full-on brawl. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins, so everything was bright. My vision was pinpoint and I felt numb. I could hear the conductor say something over the speakers about holding the train at the next platform. I stood there shaking as the guys threw him out onto that platform and made a barrier between it and the door as he attempted to shove his way back into the car, clawing at the air, sputtering curses at me and staring me dead in the eye. The subway doors finally closed, locking him outside. He pounded on them as though possessed by a demon screaming so loud you could see every sinew on his neck as he pounded at the glass. His eyes were so bloodshot they almost glowed red like a demon. I could hear his voice throughout the entire car echoing, I will kill you! Then the subway car pulled away from the station. Someone pointed to the ground. He had dropped his cell phone in the altercation. It was unlocked as well. I found out everything I could about this crazed stranger. His name, his social media handles, I saw all his selfies, and the fact he had been trying very hard and unsuccessfully to get laid. His text messages also revealed he was a drug dealer of some sort apparently. I suspected crack because of the prices, increments, and wording of the texts, which would also explain his violent outburst. I'd seen my fair share of crazy in NYC, but it hadn't gotten this up close and personal in years. I was shook and emotional following the attack. 
I went to the police station with my aunt and uncle soon after. I was filing a report when one of the cops at the station said, If it turns out you stole this phone from this guy, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Dead ass straight to my face implied I stole this phone from a complete stranger on the subway and was now spinning some elaborate web that included turning myself in at the police station. When I was filing a report of an assault as well, I wasn't wrong in thinking this guy wasn't going to be much help. I digress though. I gave them his full name and they said they had a lot of people in the system with the same exact name. Well, I have all this specific info I got off his phone. They said they couldn't use anything off of it without a warrant. They ended up taking his cell phone from me and nothing really ever came of it except for a ginormous bruise I had from getting a sharp kick to the thigh. An officer came by my house a few months later with some photos of extremely similar looking black men, none of which I could confidently identify as my assailant. I haven't heard a single thing since I filed the report and I couldn't find the guy on social media again. This means this lunatic is probably still out there, riding the subway somewhere, waiting for the next girl to reject a handshake so he can go batshit crazy. Sometimes I wonder what would have happened had it been real late at night with nobody around to help me. That guy was screaming he was going to kill me, and I'm sure he would have if given the chance. Last night, my friends, my crush, and I agreed to meet at my favorite bar after work. It was a bit early in the night since I got to leave work 30 minutes early. I went inside and ordered a beer for myself. There was this huge muscular guy with a long-ass ponytail sitting at the bar. The seat next to him was empty. He offered me to sit down, so I did. We had some small talk for a bit and he seemed nice enough. He asked me why I was all alone and he kept talking about how I looked so uneasy and nervous. I should try to relax a little. It was weird, but he had an almost empty bottle of vodka in front of him, so he was clearly very drunk, and I really didn't think much of it. My friends finally arrived just as I'd finished my first beer, and we went to sit at a table. I had three more bottles of beer, and we were having a pretty great time in all honesty. Whenever I went to the toilet, that guy from the bar was always there asking me if I was okay. That was pretty strange, but at the time I felt just a bit tipsy, and everything was going alright so far. At some point though, I started to feel very sick, so I went outside to have a cigarette and get some cold air. The guy followed me out, and once again started asking if I was alright. I was starting to get real weirded out at this point. The bar was super full, but this guy seemed to be only watching me all night. I went back inside, ordered a glass of water, and told my friends I wasn't feeling very well. I would be going home shortly. They all offered to take me, which I'm so darn grateful for looking back. I took a sip of water, and then it all just hit me at once. I ran outside and began to vomit. I could barely stand up all of a sudden. I sat down on a staircase and kept vomiting nonstop. My friends found me a few minutes later and kept arguing about whether they should take me to a taxi or carry me home. Then that guy from the bar showed up. He kept saying he lived just down the street and I could go crash on his couch if I wanted. My coworker, who was basically an older brother to me, got real pissed off and told that guy to fuck off. They forced me to stand up, which was almost impossible at that point, and dragged me to my friend's place somehow where I went to sleep hugging a bucket and feeling like I was going to die at any second. This morning, I wasn't able to stand up for hours. When I did, it resulted in instant vomiting. It was 1 p.m. when I finally managed to go to the train station, get something to eat and drink, and head home on my own. I'm still shaking and sweating, and everything looks blurry. First off, this is 100% true and all happened last night. So me and my wife went to a movie last night. Skyscraper. It was okay. We got home at around 9pm. We live in this new development. It's middle class to upper middle class in a nice, safe area. We don't have a mailbox in front of our house. 
It's one of those neighborhoods where all the mailboxes are right together at the end of our street, so we don't always check it. I knew I was getting a package from Amazon that day though, so I decided to stop by and check. I noticed there was a package in there, and a letter with a typed envelope as well, made out to my name but with a return address with no name on it. It seemed to be from the street just behind us. We didn't know anyone here very well, so I opened it up in curiosity as we drove back down the street. What I read shocked me. We're watching you, Mr. Sex Pervert, with a picture of two creepy eyes. I was very confused and floored. We get home, my wife is upset, I'm pissed off and confused. To be very clear, I'm truly not a pervert, as far as I know. I'm faithfully married to my wife. I don't have any particularly weird fetishes or kinks or anything. I've never even been accused of anything remotely perverted in my life by anyone, nor have I really done anything that could possibly come to mind. If anything, my wife had complained about me being somewhat bland and vanilla. Anyways, my wife was urging me to call the sheriff's department. They agreed it was creepy and they would send someone out, but couldn't promise it would be a priority. Then though, things got even weirder. We'd been home about five minutes total now. Our car alarm suddenly started going off. Now, this had happened before. I occasionally accidentally hit the panic button in my pocket or something while I'm reaching around. But I was sitting inside by the window, hitting the stop button. But no matter what I did, it would not turn off. Admittedly, I was getting a bit frustrated. I was already in a bad mood. I threw it down in anger and it broke my key fob, but my wife turned it off with hers. We decided to go take a drive and see what house this letter had supposedly come from behind us before the sheriff showed up to check. As we went to check though, it turned out that house number did not exist. For some reason, apparently they skipped it when numbering the street. If it had existed though, it would have been directly behind us. When we pull back up to the house, our next door neighbors and the ones across the street are both outside talking very animatedly. We go ask them what's going on. Apparently, when our car alarm was going off, so was our next door neighbors as well, and the one next to them too. They had parked in the street between our two houses. I hadn't heard theirs with mine also going off, but they were all going off at once. The neighbor across the street heard this and came out to look. Right in front of his house was this guy sitting in a black car, lights off. Once the neighbor came out, he bolted down the road as quickly as possible, with his lights still off. The neighbor tried to chase it a little by foot, trying to get a license plate, but it was too dark and they had taken off too fast. So he also called the sheriff. About two minutes later, two cars coincidentally pulled up about the same time. The one dispatched for my call and the one for his. They have no idea what to think. They asked if I had enemies, bad exes, family problems, if I'd ever been accused of anything, if I could think of anyone. But the truthful answer to all of these is no. They take a report anyways though, take the letter and evidence, and give me a card for if anything else happens. Of course, I barely slept last night. I'm just dumbstruck and completely confused. I don't know any of my neighbors except the next door ones. Not many people even know my address either. Since they used the return address of the street behind us for an address that didn't exist, I feel like they must know the area quite well. My name and address is on our HOA website, which I guess could be where they got it possibly. But I've truly not done anything to anyone. My imagination is running wild, but I'm completely out of ideas. Was the car waiting there just a coincidence? Is this all just a prank by some insane person? My wife is scared. Any ideas on what to do next or why someone would be doing this in the first place would be very appreciated. I need to vent about a situation I'm currently dealing with. My stalker, Fridge Guy. I'm a GFE escort, which stands for Girlfriend Experience. A GFE is basically a booking where the escort brings more intimacy and a genuine easy-going feeling to the appointment. We didn't have a lot in common, but I did find mental health struggles and politics were at least something we could bond over. 
Last June, he booked his first appointment with me. Since then, he's seen me 14 times, usually around once a month, always in one-hour increments. He's expressed interest on seeing me outside of work as well, but I declined that. Over the past year, he's gradually escalated in terms of offers to help me outside of work. I didn't want this help, as I didn't want to encourage the strings that would be attached to it. He also started writing me these letters that he'd hand me at the end of each session. I never returned this gesture, though. He'd bring a few odd gifts, but nothing that I would have wanted or asked for. A couple of times, this was actually quite annoying when I had to figure out what to do with them. Something like a large crate of cat food that my cat can't even eat. I was already thinking that I might need to end our interactions altogether due to him obviously getting too close. But things really started going poorly when he lost his job in May. In the following weeks, he expressed to me he thought there was a conspiracy to get him fired, as well as a conspiracy to sabotage all his interviews at other companies. I pointed out that if everybody was declining him, perhaps there was something he needed to work on. I also pointed out that maybe he should stop seeing me until he procured another source of income. At this point, I was very uncomfortable being the entirety of the locus of his happiness, especially if it was going to start making the rest of his life worse, which would only amplify that issue and make it harder for him to recover. He also kept coming to see me at work while he was sick as well. I ended up getting sick after that. This seems pretty minor, but it was a red flag that his desires trumped my need for safety and health. Things all came to a head when he brought a whole goddamn refrigerator to my work. As you can expect, because of the legality of my work, it's essential to be discreet and inconspicuous. Bringing a damn fridge to the parking lot outside my work is the exact opposite of that. I told him I couldn't accept it, and listed off I had no means of transporting this big-ass fridge home anyway. His response was that he would drive it to my house or perhaps we could take a road trip to give it to my mother. This was quite alarming. I'd never done anything to make him think this was something that could possibly happen. In fact, I'd specifically made sure to disabuse him of any of these ideas as they came up in the past. Anything like dinners, stuff like that. At that point, I had decided to ban him altogether. He was clearly out of touch with reality, and was imposing his fantasies onto me to a dangerous level. Before I emailed him to end things, he also sent me an email offering me his credit card info so I could buy the fridge online since I couldn't take it in person. This was clear obsession. At the end of June, I sent him an email trying to very gently break things off. Actually, I recommended that he speak more to his therapist and see if possibly they could adjust his meds. I knew the meds he was on could cause symptoms of schizophrenia, like his paranoia that he was developing. I also suggested he be much more careful and explained how dangerous it was to offer his credit card info to someone he paid to pretend to care about him. I'm not sure if he followed up with those things at all. Instead, this is when shit completely hit the fan. Initially, he was just banned from booking me, but he repeatedly called, emailed, and left messages non-stop at my agency for me specifically, and it quickly went into a blanket ban altogether. At that point, he began searching for providers I work with outside of our agency to avoid our screening process and get past the ban. He kept on asking if any provider-client relationships had ever turned into real ones, and they very firmly shut that down. Thankfully, those providers also informed me of what was happening. Our boss sent him an email telling him to kindly knock it off. Then he got angry and threatening. During a back and forth, he seemed to have convinced himself that my boss was preventing me from responding to him, and it was all her fault. This was of course not the case. She called him out on it, and it seemed like she'd gotten through to him. I didn't hear from him at all until about two weeks ago on November 20th. He showed up under a brand new name with an appointment for me. I'm not sure if he was waiting for a strategic opportunity, but the only reason I opened the door was because it was raining that night, and he was using his umbrella to completely block his face. Under any other circumstances, I would have never opened that door. Because of the rain, I stepped out to hold it open, while he squeezed inside with his umbrella. 
when he lowered it and I saw who he was. I stepped back, and that put me outside the door with him blocking my way back in. Fuck me for trying to be courteous, right? He kept on saying he wanted to apologize in person. He just needed the opportunity. Then he asked me to not screw it up for him with the other girls. That was particularly insulting. He was the one screwing his chances because of his terrifying actions. I just kept telling him to leave, over and over and over again. He tried to grab me as I squeezed past him, but I somehow managed to dodge it. He had taken all this time to make up a brand new identity and see outside providers, just so that one could give him a reference that would get him through our screening and wouldn't be flagged by any of his banned info. This terrified me. During the time that he'd made the new account with us was around the time we banned him the first time. I thought he'd moved on and let things go, but it turns out he's literally never stopped obsessing and trying to find a way to get to me. I felt unsafe taking on any new clients since then. This has had an incredibly detrimental impact on my mental health, as well as an impact on my bottom line since I felt unsafe taking on new clients. The next step for me may have to be a restraining order. I worry about how he would respond and escalate though. I never thought he would stalk me for months and months, so clearly I can't trust he won't do something worse. Out of concern for his safety as well, I tried to end things gently, but at this point it may need to be reinforced that I want nothing to do with him and never have. I would never and will never want to spend time without being paid, and not even that anymore. I don't like him sexually, and it's my skill at my job that allowed me to find some small common ground with him, not any true connection or friendship. I'm trying to get in contact with a psychiatrist, so maybe he can intervene medically before I have to get the law involved. This happened two days ago. I live in a small city in Romania, about 30,000 inhabitants or so. Romania isn't exactly known for their tolerance of gay people. It's not quite as bad as other places like Russia, but the situation is definitely not rosy here either. I get on Grinder and meet this guy, 18 years old apparently. The guy didn't have a picture of his face on his profile pic. Makes sense because it's too dangerous around here. He had a picture of a rose drawing instead. Most guys on Grinder here don't have pictures of themselves. We talked for a bit and I really liked the guy. Finally, we accept to exchange facial pictures. I sent him a selfie of myself, and he sent me a picture of a guy from our city. He was very cute, and I really, really liked him. So I told him, Hey, I've seen you around the city before. I didn't know you were gay too. We talked and finally arranged to meet. I had some errands to run at the tailor shop. My cousin's bachelorette party was coming next week, and I had to adjust my favorite shirt. I asked the guy to meet me in front of the tailor shop. The building in which this shop was located had four stories. The ground floor was a clothes shop which my aunt worked at, the first floor was a storage room, the third floor a barber's salon, and the fourth floor the tailor shop. I go up to the shop and then go down to the clothes shop on the ground floor to visit my aunt after and see how she's doing. As I happen to glance out the window of that clothes shop, I noticed there were five men waiting around, all of them in their late twenties behind the building. Not a single one of them was the guy I'd gotten a picture of, and none of them even remotely looked close to what he looked like either. I texted the guy I was supposed to meet, and asked him if he'd made it to the shop already. As soon as I sent the message, one of those five men's phones lit up, and he started texting me back. As soon as that guy finished texting, I got a notification from Grinder. Hey, yeah, I'm right behind the tailor shop. I went outside to smoke where no one would see me. Come on, come smoke with me. I was terrified, as I realized I was never going to meet that guy in the picture. The guy tried to get me to go behind the tailor shop. I tried to convince him and his buddies to go to the side of it instead. There were no windows to the side of the building, so after a few tries he agreed to meet me there. All five of them went around to the side. I peeked my head out the door, looked left and right to make sure, and as soon as I saw it was clear, I ran for it. 
I actually bumped into the cute guy the next day and started talking to him. I opened my phone and pretended to use it, and I actually went on Grinder at that time. I saw him look over at my screen and ask me, You're... you know. I said yes, because I kind of got the feeling he was gay too. He said me too. I told him about what had happened with those guys, and he got really scared, because those guys had used his picture and he didn't know anything about it. On a more positive note though, he agreed to go out with me when school starts up again, so that's something to look forward to. This happened to me four years ago. It's by far the most extreme and life-threatening situation I've ever been in. The eyewitness account you are about to read is 100% true and 100% mine as well. For some understanding, this happened in the United States during the summer of 2012. My longtime boyfriend and I had just recently gotten married. Even though we were dirt poor college students and lived in a dinky apartment, we were having a blast. This particular summer, we gathered with our friends at the local movie theater almost every weekend. There was one just down the street from our apartment that had really cheap movie tickets. A night out was just under $10, and that was certainly within our budget. Anyway, one Thursday night, I received a call from this group of friends inviting us to watch the midnight premiere of the newest Batman movie. I had just finished working a 12-hour shift and was really tired. I almost refused the invitation and thought about just crashing in my apartment instead. I didn't really want to miss out on all the fun though, and it was a movie I'd wanted to see for a long time anyway. What harm could it do to stay up a little bit later than usual and just miss a few hours of sleep, right? At 10.30, we met at the theater. We passed large cardboard cutouts of Catwoman and Batman as we walked inside, greeted by the smell of buttery popcorn and the chatter of excited moviegoers. The ticket booth was to the right of the entrance, and just above that was an electronic list of movies being played. The 12 a.m. showing of The Dark Knight Rises was displayed up there in bright red letters. Being paranoid that tickets would sell out quickly, one of my friends swung by earlier that day, and had purchased them for all of us. We bypassed the line and went straight to the ticket taker. She smiled at us and kindly directed us to Theater 9, which was on the right side of the lobby. If only I had known what I do now, that among those crowds a killer was lurking, that as I walked across that tacky red and purple carpet towards Theater 9, I could have very well been walking straight to my death. I think about it often now, what I would have done if I had known. Pulled the alarm, called the police, screamed for people to run away. But of course, nobody had any way of knowing what was about to happen. Oblivious to the peril I was putting myself in, I pushed open the doors for Theater 9 without giving it a second thought. The hallway in this theater was shaped like a U, and you could go either right or left. Theater 9 was the largest screening room in the building, perfect for accommodating those huge crowds that midnight premieres brought in. The screen was motionless and gray. Not even the previews had started yet. There was still a good hour and a half to go until the movie actually started. We entered on the right side, so all of the seats were to our left. I remember being surprised at just how packed the theater already was. Just about every seat was filled, much to our dismay. At first, it seemed like we wouldn't find a spot to sit together. Now, the way this theater was set up, there was a section of seats right in front of the screen. This area was flat. There were about five rows of seating in this section. A lot of the seats down there were empty, but sitting right in front of the movie screen sucks, and nobody wanted to sit there. One of my friends then spotted a row with five empty seats all right next to each other, perfect for the amount of people we had. These seats were about three to four rows up from where the seating rows started to elevate. We quickly ran up the stairs before someone could take the seats and filed in. My husband Brock sat in the fifth seat. I sat next to him. My friend Samantha sat next to me on my right side. Her boyfriend Tommy sat next to her. And another friend named Leo sat in the aisle seat. We spent the next several minutes casually chatting, joking around, and laughing. 
After a while, my three friends went to the lobby to buy drinks and that addicting movie theater popcorn. While they were gone, Brock and I passed the time by people watching. The theater was bright since the lights weren't dimmed yet and I could see everyone clearly. There were a ton of people dressed in Batman t-shirts and hoodies. One person even had a mask and one of those shirts with an attached cape. There were a lot of kids in the audience as well, which wasn't surprising because even though it was a Thursday night, it was summer vacation. No school the next day. Of all the people I saw, the person I'll never forget was this real little girl sitting in our same row just a few chairs away. She was really cute, blonde with blue eyes. She passed us several times on her way to the lobby, each time coming back with various snacks and popcorn. Overall, people seemed very excited to see this movie. The room was filled with energy and laughter. After what seemed like an eternity of waiting, the lights finally started to dim, and the previews began. Just like every movie I'd seen before, a quick animation flashed across the screen, reminding us to get refreshments from the lobby. We were already devouring that popcorn like ravenous animals. To silence all our cell phones, and to make sure we knew where the emergency exits are. The animation had this ugly CGI cat in a tuxedo that was sitting in a movie theater. I quickly glanced at the bright green emergency exit signs that were on the left and right sides of the movie screen. I didn't think much of the reminder, as usual. After that, I only remember one preview for The Man of Steel. The others, I'm not quite sure what they were about. When the movie started, it erupted into cheering and clapping. The title of the movie, The Dark Knight Rises, exploded out onto the screen. This was followed by the scene where Bane is hijacking a plane. I thought this scene was pretty cool and it caught my interest right away. Only when the movie started to get a little less interesting did I remember just how tired I was. I decided I would close my eyes at the more boring parts to get a little bit of rest. I had been awake for a full 20 hours at that point so I was rightfully sleepy. My eyes were closed for most of the duration of Batman and Catwoman's encounter. I don't really remember what was going on during that part of the movie. Anyway, I opened my eyes again and Bruce Wayne was on his computer digging up information on Catwoman. That was the last scene I saw. I never got to watch the rest of the movie. All of a sudden a loud bang erupted from the left side of the theater. I sort of screamed a little because it startled me. A strange smell started to fill the auditorium. It was like the smell of a firework. I thought maybe somebody had thrown a cherry bomb or something similar. Had someone thrown fireworks into the crowd as a prank? Then though, down near the right side of the movie screen, a dark silhouette of a person caught my attention. It was just a black frame against the bright movie screen. The series of flashing lights was coming from this person. It was this strange moment where time literally slowed down and everything went strangely quiet. I was completely frozen unable to move and unable to comprehend what was happening. It was like my brain had stopped working entirely. Brock caught on immediately to what was happening though and grabbed me. He pulled me to the ground and laid down on top of me, shielding me with his own body. At this point in time, sound returned to me. I could hear gunshots ringing out across the theater. People were screaming. The movie was still playing on top of it all, creating a chaotic explosion of sound. I realized the flashing lights were the muzzle flash of a gun barrel. An instant sensation of adrenaline flooded my body, but there was absolutely nothing I could do except lay down and hope to God the bullets I heard tearing through the seats and walls wouldn't tear through me too. At one point, a piece of shrapnel hit my head, slicing off a good chunk of my hair, and as I reached for the spot to make sure it wasn't bleeding, hot pieces of metal fell into my hand. I was lying face up so I could see everything that was happening. The lights from the still-playing movie danced across the ceiling and walls. My friends were on the floor with me. Our unfinished bucket of popcorn spilled across the floor. Leo had his legs sticking out into the aisle. There wasn't enough room for him to hide completely behind all the seats. At some point, Samantha's water bottle, which had been sitting in the cup holder between our seats, exploded. Water splashed all over my face. The smell of gun smoke was overwhelming. Riot grade tear gas made me cry and caused me to cough uncontrollably. It was another smell too. The horrible metallic smell of blood that I'll never forget. I remember my lower body feeling wet all of a sudden. 
For some reason, I thought this came from the leaking water bottle, but I soon realized that wasn't the case. All of a sudden, things went strangely quiet. The bullets had stopped for some reason. Tommy shouted, Let's get out of here! We took advantage of the opportunity and made a run for it. We ran down the stairs, across the front of the screen, toward the bright green exit sign. We crammed into a small closet-like space where the door was. It was so dark we had a hard time finding it. We were screaming and slamming on the walls to find this door, blinded by tear gas and dumbfounded by shock. Finally, my hands felt the metal door handle, and I pushed in with all my strength. The door flew open, and the light of a nearby streetlight flooded our eyes. We pushed against the door so hard, we all fell out onto the concrete. Samantha lost her pink flip-flops just outside this doorway. I scrambled to my feet and literally ran for my life. I realized my legs were red, absolutely soaked with blood. It was like I had dipped my legs into a bathtub full of it. I checked all over my body and realized I wasn't injured at all. So where had all this blood come from? I looked behind me and realized the blood was my husband's. He had been shot right in the leg. There was a massive gaping hole ripped right through the lower half of Brock's right leg. His foot was barely hanging on and dangling lifelessly. Leo and a man I didn't recognize were carrying him, because after falling outside the door he lost all his strength and couldn't even walk. I was completely shocked. I had no idea he had been injured, especially since he was right behind me the whole time and managed to escape by himself. How he did this on only one foot I will never know. At this point I screamed. My scream was so loud it alerted nearby construction workers. At the back of the theater there was a narrow parking lot, followed by a grassy lawn, and then the street beyond that. The construction workers were doing road repair, but as soon as they heard my scream and saw us running, they stopped working and watched what was going on. I'm not sure why this is such a vivid part of my memory. Anyway, they carried Brock along the back sidewalk all the way to the end, where the corner of the building is. That was quite a distance, several dozen feet. My husband then collapsed from exhaustion and pain, saying he couldn't move anymore. He laid down and a puddle of blood started forming beneath him. I looked back and realized we had left a huge trail leading from the door all the way to our current position. I was trembling. I knelt beside Brock and glanced around to see who else was injured. Tommy had been shot in the knee and the hip and was further away in the parking lot. The teenager who helped my husband was also injured. His dad and mom were with him. His mom was sitting against the wall and looked like she was going to pass out at any moment. She was bleeding from several places. That family had escaped at the same time as we did. We were all lucky though, because the shooting was still going on inside. I had to take off my shirt and use it to stop the bleeding. I'll never forget how lifeless and limp his leg felt. I imagine that's what a dead body must feel like. I got blood all over my hands and arms. The police showed up really, really fast. I'd say we were only outside for a minute or two before the red and blue sirens filled the night and rushed to our location. A female officer stood by us the whole time until paramedics arrived, which took a very long time. Brock was the last one to be taken to a hospital. He was bleeding out for almost 20 minutes before an ambulance pulled up on the same street with the road work. At this point, he had almost become unresponsive and was on the verge of unconsciousness. Several massive guys rushed across the grass with a stretcher, loaded him onto it, and then ran back with him to the waiting ambulance. I wasn't able to go with him because there was another injured person as well, and it was too crowded. I wandered around to the front of the theater alone, unsure of where my friends had gone. My blood-stained shirt and a pool of blood were left behind on the corner of that sidewalk. Walking through the crowds felt almost like a dream. I couldn't believe what had just happened. People were in hysterics and crying. A lot of people, such as me, were covered in blood. And like me, I'm pretty sure the blood staining their skin and clothes was not their own. A lot of people seemed to notice how lonely and dazed I looked, so they kept me company and even offered me a ride to different hospitals to find Brock. I hadn't been told where he was going. I hung around these people for a while, as police swarmed the area and asked us what we saw inside the theater. The whole parking lot was on lockdown, and we weren't going to be allowed to leave anytime soon. It was around 2am, and it was very dark outside still. I was pretty cold and wearing only an undershirt and shorts. 
The flashing red and blue lights of what seemed like 100 police cars were blinding. I remember seeing a big police vehicle pull up that said something like crime scene investigation unit on it. I think that's when it really sank in and hit me. I started to get sick to my stomach and wanted to vomit, but somehow I was able to hold it back. Eventually, police started letting people leave. I jumped into my truck and booked it out of there. I was in such a panic I didn't even think to go back to my apartment. I grabbed my cell phone and called my parents or anyone else to help me. I was angry, upset, scared, and most of all still in a state of shock. Was I really going to lose Brock only a month shy of our first wedding anniversary just because of some psychopath with a gun? Thankfully, by the time Don rolled around, found the hospital he was being treated in. It was the next city over, maybe 45 minutes from the theater if you're going the speed limit. I was so happy to be there, and the hospital staff were all so welcoming and understanding. After making sure I wasn't injured as well, they let me wait in the ICU room that Brock would be placed in when he was done recovering from surgery. I was so glad he was alive. Brock and Tommy both had survived, though many others were not so lucky. I found out the following day that 12 people had been killed in this shooting, and 70 were injured. That little blonde girl I'd seen sitting in my row did not survive. She died in that theater no more than a few feet from us, shot multiple times. A heartbroken police officer who cried during his court testimony tried unsuccessfully to save her by carrying her out of the theater and having her sent to a hospital. Tommy had been rushed to a different one in the back of a police car. He underwent surgery and made a full recovery. The bullet missed his hip bone and narrowly missed his urinary tract and bladder. According to the surgeons, my husband lost almost half his blood. Luckily, he made it to the hospital in time. Any later and he would have died. He had to undergo several transfusions and was in the hospital for 21 days. The wound to his leg was severe enough that they had to amputate it after trying unsuccessfully to save it. It's been so long since the shooting happened that my husband, friends, and I have been able to recover from it somewhat. The event was pretty horrifying and has left us scarred for sure. I wouldn't consider that part of the story to be creepy though. No, the creepy part is the shooter himself. I later learned much about him from the murder trial that would follow in the coming years. Though my encounter with this man was very brief, he affected my life greatly. Just to know that people like this exist is disturbing. He certainly is one twisted individual I would never like to meet again. I learned everything from watching the televised trial that took place in early 2015. This guy was going to school for neuroscience or something in California. I guess he was a pretty smart guy. For some reason, though, he had an obsession with killing people and a stalker mentality. After dropping out of university, he moved to my state and chose my local theater to commit this shooting. Before that, he was planning on hiding along remote hiking trails in the mountains, jumping people, pulling them into the woods, and killing them there, though he never went through with that idea. He'd staked out my theater for months and had this shooting all planned out for the night of July 20th, though I never saw him before this. It's unnerving to think this guy could have been watching us every time we went there, and we would have never known. We were completely unaware of what he had planned against us. This completely ruined my sense of security, because who knows what the stranger next to you is planning on doing. I came very close to the shooter, but I never actually saw his face in person until I was forced to testify in court. Of course, I'd seen his mugshots on television, but while in the theater, I'd only seen him as a dark silhouette in the shadows, like some demonic figure rendered from the darkest and most sinister nightmare. He was even in the hallway that we passed upon running for the emergency exit. The only thing that stopped him from killing us right then and there was that he had jammed his assault rifle. To commit his crime, he ordered a few thousand rounds of ammunition, riot gear and armor, tear gas, an assault rifle, and a shotgun. He took pictures of himself which were shown in court, wearing all of this gear like some sort of sick trophy, holding up these weapons with a menacing smile. He dyed his hair orange and put in these creepy black contacts while making devilish faces into his camera, something that made me sick just looking at it. Before driving to the theater with all this gear in his car, he booby-trapped his entire apartment and set it to explode if anyone opened the door. Then, once at the theater, he posed as a moviegoer and even bought a ticket for the movie. 
I think his ticket had Theater 8 on it, which was next door, but Theater 9 had more people, so he went into that one instead. He was in the first front rows. I must have passed him several times in the lobby while he was there. Maybe he had seen me, too. At some point during the movie, he got up and went through the side exit, which didn't have an alarm for some reason. He kept it propped open with something, then went to his car to put on all his armor and grabbed his weapons, and he came back inside and started shooting. When we escaped the theater, we ran right past his white car, which had been parked right next to the exit. We didn't even notice it. At some point, he came outside, and he would have seen us there on the concrete. I don't know what stopped him from shooting the people who were out there, too, but he could have easily ended us there and then if he wanted to. I think the hardest part about this for me was facing this man in court. I'll never forget rising as they called my name, walking down the center row past my family, other survivors, and crowds of news-hungry media personnel. I sat right across from him, maybe only ten feet away. While his orange hair was gone, and he wasn't wearing black contacts, being close to him was a creepy and uncomfortable experience. My encounters with this man are ones I'll certainly never forget. I can now say I've come face to face with a true, deranged psychopath. He just had this blank stare in his eyes the whole time. If eyes truly are the windows to the soul, then his soul was filled with nothing but a cold indifference for those he had murdered and harmed. He wouldn't even look at me. Sitting across from him in court was the second time I had knowingly been in the same room with this man. A man who tried to take my life but thankfully failed. A man who would end up spending forever behind bars, when at the end of it all, he was sentenced to 3,318 years in prison for his crimes. For six months last year, I lived in the north of Spain. About a week before I was going to move back to Ireland, my friend and I were at my house having dinner and drinking a bit. I was renting an apartment in the city, and my roommate was an older lady, maybe around her 50s, I think. I'm 20, by the way. That night, my roommate left to go have some dinner with her friends. About a minute after she left, someone buzzed our door to be let into the building. I looked at the camera and I didn't recognize the woman I saw. She looked to be in her late 20s to early 30s, so I assumed it must have been one of my roommate's friends, perhaps someone who was coming to meet her or something like that. I buzzed her into the building, assuming they would meet up in the lobby. At first, I didn't want to buzz her in because I didn't recognize her, and she'd walked away from the door. I hit the buzzer as soon as she walked away, and then I myself walked away from the camera, meaning I couldn't see if she'd actually entered or not. I assumed if she didn't, she would just call or text my roommate. Boy, was I wrong. This woman came straight up to my apartment building on the sixth floor. She came up just two minutes after my roommate left, so I know she didn't take the stairs. I know they must have seen each other when my roommate got off the lift, and that lady got in. Realizing this was quite weird, I didn't open the door when she came up and rang it. I looked out the peephole just to confirm, and from this close, I knew this was nobody I knew. At this point, I backed away from the door and gestured for my friend to be silent. We crept back to my room, which was at the far side of the apartment. I began to call my roommate who was not picking up. Meanwhile, the lady was incessantly ringing my door. My roommate was still not answering. My friend was telling me to just open the door. In her mind, it was a woman, so she must be harmless. I told her she was an idiot for underestimating the female sex. I mean, women can be criminals too. She just kept telling me to open the door, and I refused. I could hear the door still ringing, so I crept out to look through the peephole. At this point, I understand that if she knew my roommate or was looking for someone in specific, she'd just call or text them. She didn't take out a phone at all though. She just stood there, eerily silent. Didn't call out any names or ask if anyone was home. This was so weird to me. I finally got through to my roommate. She said she wasn't expecting anyone and didn't know anyone in that age range. She became quite worried and asked if I was okay. I told her I would be fine. Now it had been at least 20 minutes. 
I know the lady knows someone is home because the lights are on, and my understanding is that's why she refused to leave. I continued to watch her through the peephole, and saw her go into the lift for a minute, then sneak back out again. The lift is really loud, so I would have heard it move. It didn't, though. She just went in and then came right back out. In my mind, this means someone in the lift was waiting for her. This all just screamed sketchy to me. After about 40 minutes, she finally left. I ran into our hall and flicked on the outside camera. The lady left the building with two men. They all had backpacks on. I'll be eternally grateful for trusting my instincts and not listening to my friend. Sometimes, it's way better to be safe than sorry. When I was about seven years old, my father bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi, about 1.5 hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about five miles from a paved road. To get to our land, it took nearly ten minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was just south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house he built was a small lake, more like a pond really. It was about as long as a football field, but slightly wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take Route A, which was a hard-packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was quite beautiful in the spring. Route B was about 100 yards east of Dogwood Lane. We named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days, and it had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was not made for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and my little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour or two. I was 10 years old, so I decided to go fishing instead while listening to Bama play Ole Miss. The game was the usual Bama win, so I thought I could ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake. I carried my pole, my small radio, and my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bully that never left my side. It was on this day I realized just how awesome he really was. On to the lake we went. Picture a large oval. Roughly the size of a football field, but larger, with an L-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up on a more severe decline to the shore, and then the small pier. Across the lake on the west side, there was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam, and the south ended in thick and swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized that later. About five minutes after I tossed out my line, and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I've come to recognize well, and must have saved my life this day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bully must have felt it too, because only a few seconds later, I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west, to the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from the lake. I turned my head in that direction, and almost immediately my eyes lit on what I thought to be a half silhouette of a large man, hiding behind a tree. I was too far out to make out the details, but close enough to be sure that's what I was seeing. About five minutes went by, and right before I'd scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half silhouette began to sneak slowly. Bully stood and growled louder, and I told him quietly to stop. I turned my head north towards the dam, while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next ten minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure slowly snuck from tree to tree, always north, and always facing me. The saying, scared stiff, was something I found to be true in that moment. For some reason, I thought it important that whoever or whatever it was did not know I was aware of them. I finally realized that the figure's path was bringing it closer to the dam, which would make its path to me shorter and easier. My paralysis finally broke. I put down my fishing pole 
and started towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that entire walk was the hardest thing I have ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was must be screaming across the dam towards me right now. When I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bully dashed ahead of me, and my anger turned into admiration as he stopped some 20 yards ahead and faced north until I passed by him. He continued this action my entire run home. My dog had my back, and it was just epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep on a ten-year-old boy was not up to any good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns, as well as his 38 revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings and the woods between them. My family returned shortly after, and for some reason I didn't tell them about what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends or my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were always with us. What scares me the most, though, is the fact that our closest neighbors were two miles northwest of us, with thick woods in between as the crow flies. Who or what the hell was watching me from the woods that day? I guess I may never know. I sometimes wish I could go back then, as a grown man with military training, as I am now. Bully lived a full life and was put to sleep peacefully as a very old but great dog. The best dog I've ever known, really. When I was 19 in the early 90s, my brother and his wife were newly married and living out in Baltimore. I was from Maryland, but I had not yet spent any time in that city. I knew it wasn't totally safe in parts, but I also knew that I was just going straight to my brother and sister-in-law's house, so surely it would be fine. Until I accidentally turned onto the wrong street. This was Martin Luther King Boulevard. Back then, it was a stretch of abandoned gas stations, sketchy bars, boarded up houses. A few people were walking in the middle of the street drinking out of paper bags. I knew immediately I had messed up. Instead of freaking out and getting more lost, though, I pulled over to an abandoned gas station. There was a bank of pay phones, and I parked about 10 feet from them, hopped out, and called my brother. He was impatient at first, because he knew the city quite well. It was my first time driving at it, though, and I was trying to write down his directions as he gave them to me. Just then, something caught my eye. I looked over at my car. I saw three men were leaning against it, two on the passenger side, one against the driver's side front door. They were all staring at me with their arms crossed. I started to silently cry, thankful I had sunglasses on. My brother heard me sniffling. Why are you upset? I'm giving you directions right now. I couldn't tell him what was going on, though. The men were all within earshot. I got the rest of the directions, put them into my pocket, and walked over to my car. The man leaning against the door reached up and wiped the tears from one cheek. Then he said, Why are you crying, baby? Nothing bad has happened yet. Without even thinking about it, I responded, fully sobbing now. I just shot my boyfriend and I'm in a lot of trouble. The cops are... That's all I managed to get out. The three men had all taken off in separate directions at full sprints away from me. If I hadn't been gifted that lie from my guardian angels, or whatever saved my ass by putting it into my brain that day, who knows what might have happened to me. This story took place when I was 23 years old, close to 10 years ago. I was living in upstate New York, in a very rural area with my ex-boyfriend and his family. He and I used to argue quite a bit, actually. One morning before he went to work, he and I got into a very heated argument. He was 20 years my senior, but during this particular fight he acted majorly juvenile. He jumped out of bed, flipped me the bird, and yelled, 
If you don't like it so much, why don't you go back to the fucking Bronx or something? That was all the prompting I needed. I threw on my Uggs in my winter jacket, grabbed my cigarettes, and flew out of the house. I'm unfortunately an impulsive ass, and didn't think to grab my cell phone before I'd stormed out. I didn't drive at the time, so my only option really was to walk. I don't think at that time I intended to fully walk back to the Bronx, as I was a three-hour car ride upstate, but I just needed to go for my angry, dramatic walk. I realized once I got to this road at the entrance of the trailer park that I had no idea where anything really was around me. I'd only lived there for a few months at that point, and we didn't exactly go out a lot. I banked left and just walked and walked where I knew civilization was. I found myself walking alongside a very busy stretch of road, with 18-wheelers flying by, spraying me with slushy snow and soaking my shoes. I saw my then-boyfriend driving by on his way to work as he sped up and drove right past me, evidently still quite angry about our fight. I thought for sure he was going to turn around at some point, but he just never came back. I pressed on, deciding instead to try to walk to my best friend's mother's house, which I knew to be in the same town. It started to snow, though, and I was quickly losing my momentum. I passed by a VFW, where a nondescript pickup truck was parked in the driveway. It wasn't until I had passed it that I even realized the driver was still in the front seat. He called out to me. Hey, honey, do you need help? My stomach churned, realizing I would have to accept this stranger's offer. I approached his truck slowly and tried to weigh out my options. He was clean-cut, seemingly normal, and an older white guy. Gray hair, greenish-blue eyes, just really average. I don't know why, but in that moment I blurted out, Are you a good guy or a bad guy? I cringed at myself for asking such a dumb question. <laughs> I'm a good guy. I wouldn't tell you if I was a bad guy either, you know. I ignored the bells going off in my head and got in the front seat with him. As we drove, I realized I had no clue where my friend's mom actually lived. I knew the name of the road she lived on, but it spanned a good distance, so it wasn't very helpful in terms of finding my actual destination. I asked to borrow his cell phone, so I could try calling my best friend to ask her where the fuck I was supposed to be going. I called her three times and she didn't answer, because she didn't recognize the number. I started to feel inexplicably hopeless. After a few minutes, he asked me where I was from, and why I was out in the middle of nowhere in the snow wearing only pajamas. I explained I was originally from the Bronx, and had gotten into a fight with my boyfriend. He paused. Hey, you wouldn't be interested in making a little money, would you? I chuckled nervously. Oh, uh, no thanks, though. Well, I just figured since you said you were from the Bronx... Realizing at that point I was definitely in some deep shit, I muttered, Oh, sure. He eyed me up and down and laughed to himself before sneering. Sure, sure, she says. I started to panic big time, but I knew I couldn't show my fear. I scoured the scenery for a pillowy snowbank I could land in if I leapt out of the truck, but there was no avail. The houses now were so few and far between, I became certain this would be how I met my demise. I'll never know why, but it was at this point that he decided to ask me who I was going to see. I quickly blurted out my best friend's mom's name, and her husband's name as well. He instantly perked up and explained he knew the husband, how they used to snowmobile together 20 years ago. I felt the greatest wave of relief when he explained that he knew exactly where his old buddy lived. When we finally pulled up to that big yellow house, it was like arriving in the promised land. I sheepishly asked his name, Steve. Then he asked mine. I gave him a fake name, spat out a bullshit thank you, and ran as fast as I could from his truck to the porch. I crashed through the front door and locked it behind me. I immediately started crying and running through the house trying to find my friend's mom. I had awoken her from a sound sleep, but she didn't say a word about it upon seeing how shaken up I was. Once I knew I was safe with her, I explained everything. The fight, the fleeing, the weird guy in a sexual proposition. She listened horrified and curious at the same time. She made me promise to never do anything so reckless again, and that instead, if I needed, to call her. She told me she would ask her husband when he got home about this Steve guy and find out more about him. 
I returned to my boyfriend's later that same day and got really stoned to try and forget about the events of that morning. The following day, my friend's mom called me to tell me that Steve was a dangerous person who her husband had cut off communication with years ago. Last he had heard, he had been arrested for a sexual assault. She then went on to point out how incredibly easy it would have been for him to hurt me and leave me just about anywhere on some lonely stretch of road. No one would even know where to look for me, not to mention I might have never been found until the snow thawed out. Upon sharing this, the best friend of mine mentioned in this story reminded me I'd left out a super unsettling detail. When her mom called, she was able to tell me Steve's last name. One of the first results on Google with his name plus the town's name brought me straight to a registered sex offender website with a mugshot of him. His eyes looked cold and empty, and I realized with him being on probation at that time, he would have been especially eager to not have me get him in any further trouble with the law. Her mom said it best when she told me I must have had some serious guardian angels looking out for me that day. I'll start by saying I have a terrible biological father. He's been a shady person all my life and constantly caused me a lot of grief. This is just one of those examples. When I was four, my parents split up. My mother and I moved states, and they agreed I would visit my dad every school holiday for a week. This one particular time, I had been with him for a few days when I was playing with my cousin at a nearby park. A car pulled up alongside us, and I recognized the man inside as one of my dad's friends. He called me over, and without even thinking, I ran over to him and left my cousin there at the park. He asked me if I could show him where my dad lived, and I agreed happily and got into his car. I gave directions, and didn't notice at all that the person wasn't following them correctly. Looking back, I really didn't know the way myself anyhow. After way too long, I did realize we were getting closer to the city, which was far away from my dad's house. We pulled up at a home I didn't recognize, and the man told me to wait in the car. I did, and didn't feel scared at all for some reason. He eventually took me inside, and I definitely started to feel unsafe then. I mainly remember two girls passed out with their tops off, and a much older man that was feeling them up everywhere. I made eye contact with this man, and and it made me sick to my stomach. I definitely figured out I was in a bad situation at this point. A lady took me into a bedroom and brought me a sandwich. The bread was stale and I wasn't very hungry, but I ate it because I felt very bad for her. It doesn't make a lot of sense, I guess, but that's what I was thinking at the time. The lady told me a lot of things I didn't quite understand, but when she left, I remember thinking my dad was coming to pick me up soon. I fell asleep waiting for him. I wet the bed that night and no one came to see me the next day until I cried very loudly and started banging on the door. That lady came back and yelled at me for stinking up her bedroom and I asked about my dad. She said he was coming tonight after he finished work. She didn't offer me a shower or a bath so I just sat there in my soiled pants all day. After that, everything turned into a blur really. My dad did not come that night. I was so terrified. In my head, it felt like I was trapped there for months. I thought I was missing school and everyone must have forgotten about me. In reality, I was only there for five days. They let me take one shower. I don't remember eating much except for boring sandwiches. I think I had chips and gravy once as well. Finally, my mom drove across the country to come and get me. After not being able to get a hold of me or my dad for so long and me missing my pre-booked flight home, she panicked and came looking for me. Thank God she did. She found my dad at his girlfriend's house, methed out completely and hiding out. Turns out he owed a lot of drug money to the people who had taken me. They had told him that they had me, but he couldn't afford to get me back. Or maybe he didn't want me back. Whatever it was, he didn't even bother to try. My amazing mom paid his debt for him after borrowing from a lot of people, and she came to get me back. I remember when someone came into that room and told me my mom was here. I walked out and I could smell her. It was the best feeling to feel safe again. She took me home and I didn't see my dad again for a very long time. She never called the police. My parents' relationship was very complicated then. 
and I fully understand the choices she made. I definitely am okay now, though. I've spoken about this in therapy, and I've come to terms with most of the things that I went through as a child. Still, it's a fucked up situation for a four-year-old girl to have to be in. The year was 1995, and I was just 16 years old. I lived in a three-bedroom, two-bath house in a middle-class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140-pound Doberman, Turbo. From the front door of our house, you could see directly into our living room, which had an open-concept floor plan with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors. This was back when people still did that sort of thing. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone, when the only car was gone as well. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I'd never really noticed anything off, and I never noticed anything after he came either, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday, and my mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you would open all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the sliding back door and front door wide open to get a bit of a cross breeze going. Neither screen door was locked either. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door, in shorts and a tank top, with unlocked doors. It's a good thing we gain intelligence as we age. In my defense, though, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor right next to me, and probably only for that reason am I still alive today. Around the approximate time I expected my family to return home from the store, Turbo suddenly began barking. Assuming he was simply barking out their arrival, I told him to shush and tried to go back to sleep. Turbo, though, God bless his sweet protective soul, continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after five or ten minutes of Turbo refusing to be quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was wrong here. A man who I didn't know at all stood seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming this man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the ten steps to the unlocked screen door constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized to the man for my dog and for not hearing his knocking, though he never had knocked in the first place. The man explained he was from some telephone company and was there to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo, though, and Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see into the street. Only unmarked privately owned cars lined the street sides. I looked at this man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I wasn't that much of a fool. Phone company personnel A. Always wear uniforms. B. Always drive company vehicles. C. Don't come without getting called. And D. They most definitely don't work weekends. I looked at the man, who had yet to look up from the 140-pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it tight. This got his attention. He looked directly into my eyes as I said, You have 30 seconds to show me your identification, or I open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo tight. I then gave him the meat we had in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty I would have been attacked if he hadn't been there. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But really, what would a small screen door latch do against an intruder that really wanted to get in? And that creep stood there and watched me for 10 minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear. But maybe he was just working out his angles, and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to attack anyone who threatened me changed his mind in the end. That's my theory. 
Turbo has long since passed away, but his legacy still lives on, and two loving, loyal, and lethal when necessary dogs sleep in my room every night. Back in about 2000 or 2001 or so, I was driving by myself from visiting my mom in Colorado back to Arizona. I was in a station wagon and had a desk my mom had given me that was my grandfather's. I've always been scared driving at night that there's someone in my back seat that's going to get me or something. This might be because of too many scary movies or perhaps because my own mom's paranoia has rubbed off on me over the years. I was in the army and drove back and forth a lot to go visit her. I remember she would always get mad at me for sleeping at rest stops or gas stations and tell me someone was going to kidnap me and kill me. I just didn't want to be bothered with the hassle and expense of a motel most of the time though. I digress. Anyway, I'm driving an empty stretch of highway very late at night with no other cars around. All of a sudden, this red truck comes up behind me flashing his lights and honking his horn at me. I was thinking to myself that there was something wrong with my car, or perhaps there was something wrong with the desk in the hatchback. Why else would this guy be so insistent on pulling me over? So, I did pull over. I was in my mid-twenties and still a bit naive. As I'm getting out of my car, he's directly behind me, still flashing his lights and honking his horn. I got to about midway between his car and mine, I still planned on going back to see what could have been wrong with my car, when it suddenly hit me. Why is he still honking at me when I'm not in my car anymore? That was pretty odd. Then he hopped out of his truck. That's when I knew something just wasn't right. I jumped back in my car and sped off. The next exit was 45 miles or so away. He followed me the entire time. I took the first exit and went to a crowded grocery store with a laundromat next to it. There was an ambulance parked at the laundromat with its lights flashing as well. I was right there next to it. I figured if there was an ambulance there already, then eventually a police officer would probably come as well, right? The man stayed in his truck in the grocery store parking lot, watching me the entire time. I was terrified. I didn't want to get out of my car again, and felt like an idiot if I would have had to tell someone what happened. After waiting an entire hour, he finally left. After he left, I waited a little bit longer before continuing my drive back to Arizona. I was paranoid and watchful for any red trucks the entire time. Fast forward now about five or six years. I'm watching Unsolved Mysteries or some similar type crime show with my hubby at the time. He knew what happened as we were dating while this occurred. Guess what story popped up? A story about a man on that exact same stretch of highway that drove a red truck, that used those exact tactics, and would get women to pull over and murder them after. I'm really glad my gut told me something was wrong, and to get back in my car and drive. My best friend is an influencer. Not big time or anything, but big enough following to get some free shit every now and then. And they've even gotten two sponsored trips as well. She still works a full-time job, but does the Instagram thing on the side mostly because of the perks. She's not big enough to live off of this yet. Anyways, this was her first trip. A little boutique hotel from Miami contacted her via Instagram and DMs and offered her an all-expenses-paid trip to Miami for Memorial Weekend in 2018. In exchange, she would be in the hotel and take pics and do a couple of stories. She was told she could bring a female friend with her if she wanted to, and everything would be completely covered for her. This was her first time doing something like this, so at the time she wasn't really sure how it was supposed to work. They sent her a bogus contract for her to sign, and it said she'd be responsible for paying for her plane ticket to Miami, and she'd be reimbursed for whatever the cost was later. This was supposedly to prevent a no-show, meaning the influencer gets the ticket purchased by the hotel and then just never shows up. It seemed reasonable to her at the time. 
she invited me, a gay dude, instead of a female friend because she was super nervous about the whole thing. We figured it wouldn't be that big a deal, and worst case scenario, they wouldn't pay for my plane ticket and she'd just cover it for me anyway. That would be about it. We were supposed to be picked up by the hotel at the airport, so the day comes and we arrive to Miami. There's this guy holding a sign with her last name, and the paper has the hotel logo as well. We were greeted and were escorted to a black SUV. Here's where it gets weird. As soon as we were gonna get in the car, the driver was immediately visibly upset. We thought he was talking to the guy who was walking us over, but he was talking to my friend. He had a very thick accent and was wearing dark shades. He was telling my friend she was not allowed to bring her boyfriend, me, and she said it was two girls. Two girls! The hotel told me two girls. Not one girl, one guy. He was demanding to see where the other female was. We were both speechless and confused. The guy who walked us to the car looked very annoyed. He got in the passenger seat and started to fight with the driver in Portuguese. He then immediately turned to us and asked where the other girl was at. My friend tells them very upset by now that there was no other girl. She was at insert name and that I'm just a friend coming with her on the trip. The big guy in the passenger seat got out, tossed our luggage out of the car, and said something like, This is fucking bullshit. He got in the car and they both took off right away. That was it. We were in complete shock. Utter and complete shock. My friend immediately emailed Melissa, the PR person we'd been in contact to email with, to tell her what had happened. Of course, there was no response. We decided to take a cab and show up to the hotel. When we show up is when everything made sense. The hotel had been rebranded and had a completely different name, owner, and staff. We showed them the Instagram, and indeed the Instagram of the hotel it used to be, but not the new one. They never contacted us. They had never done anything. Whoever was in charge of the old Instagram account for the hotel did, or whoever got a hold of it in the end, I guess. Mind you, this was a somewhat big hotel account with above 10,000 followers. It was real at one time, but upon further inspection, we realized all of the pics were super old, and so were the posts as well. It was a defunct account. My friend felt like an idiot and would not stop crying. We called the police, met up with a detective, but nothing ever really came of it. They investigated who was running the account before or who had access to it. None of the people who used to run it had anything to do with this event. This meant that nothing really ever came of this. It's upsetting and scary to know that whoever wanted to abduct my friend or any other girls by using this old hotel Instagram knows who my friend is. That Instagram has since been deleted and we never heard anything from anyone ever again. To think my friend would have been kidnapped had she gone with another girl instead of me sends chills down my spine to this very day. So this happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer, and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, my grandma is really chill by the way, was a huge dream. I could stay out as late as I wanted to without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel like you're invincible. You don't really think about how many fucked up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't really worried about walking alone at night. The day on which this story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8 p.m., when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time in the end, and ended up leaving her house at about 10.30 p.m. At least at this point the rain had mostly stopped, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab instead. I'm surprised she believed me honestly, but maybe she just really didn't care too much. So, there I go on my way, 
called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in about 30 minutes, but I did not tell her I was walking there alone. If there was one thing that did scare me, it was the huge train tracks you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest way. I decided to take the longer way around through this sort of nature preserve. I'm not exactly sure what to call it. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into view. Just at its beginning, I saw a man standing there. It was a small quiet town so it was not common for people here to be out this late, but I wasn't scared immediately. I could only see his back, but he looked just like every other guy you'd pass by on the street. He didn't seem to notice me either, so I really didn't care that much. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was now nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling on my back. This man couldn't have already been out of my view. It would have been impossible for him to move that fast. He would have had to sprint and I definitely would have heard him running on this metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought he might be hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eye off of those bushes. I hid behind a tree and decided to wait for a few minutes, just to see if he really was hiding there. After only about ten minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. I could make out in the dark that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see that knife before? Where had he been hiding it? He suddenly started to sprint in my direction. It was so fast, it was almost inhuman. He ran straight past me hiding behind this tree. I was so relieved when he did that. When he was out of sight, I sprinted off faster than I've ever ran before, not stopping to look behind me, being frightened the whole way back. I thought somehow he managed to track me down and do whatever sick thing he had in mind. Luckily though, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me already mad. I decided not to tell her what happened, partially to not worry her, but also so she wouldn't tell my parents about our secret curfew. Looking back, this was one of the stupidest lies I've ever told. Because of what happened just a month after this incident, two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found about 30 meters from it. The other had been thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure it was that same man who I encountered that day. I was too scared to come out and tell anyone about what happened but I can't help but feel those two girls would still be alive today if it wasn't for my own stupidity. I live in a middle low-class neighborhood in the Caribbean. It's a quiet place where nothing really happens, the type of place people go and retire to and sip pina coladas all day. However, just a few houses next to mine lived a family that was not like the rest. They had the biggest house on the street and lived very luxuriously. Their kids would play with me a lot, especially the smallest girl who we all nicknamed Tiny. Tiny was about five when I was eleven, and she was always over at my house. I knew my mom and the neighbors were concerned about a five-year-old being all day outside and not arriving at her house until midnight on school days, but it was a quiet place where nothing ever happened, so no one really got too worried. When Tiny turned six, her parents threw a giant birthday party for her, and all of the neighborhood kids were invited. I wanted to go. They had bouncy houses, water slides, and everything a kid could want to play with, but my parents wouldn't allow me to do so. I never quite knew why this was, I supposed it was because my mom didn't know her mom very well. I remember feeling very sad because everyone was there and I was stuck playing alone at my house. After the birthday, things went back to normal. One day, when we were all playing and talking about what our parents did for work, we asked Tiny and her siblings. None of them knew what their parents did, except their dad traveled a lot and was always at meetings. 
I didn't pay that much attention, though, and we all continued on with our day. One night, we were playing out on the street when we started hearing loud pops coming from Tiny's house. I'll never forget that day. The neighbors, including my mom, came out rushing us inside, yelling that there was someone shooting. Some of us got into my house, and we stayed there as my next-door neighbor, a cop, ran towards Tiny's house. All we saw after the gunshots was a black van rushing down the street, almost running over a dog in its hurry. Some men entered the house after. Tiny and her siblings wanted to check what was going on, but everyone forbade them to go. All I can remember was a bunch of cops and ambulances rushing in a few minutes later. After that day, I never saw Tiny or her siblings again. For a couple of months, the house sat empty, but black vans and strange men kept coming into the neighborhood, door to door, asking for any information about the man and his children. No one in the neighborhood spoke about it. I know the cops asked me about Tiny and the kids and if they ever said something weird about their dad and mom, but I was only 11 and more concerned with playing Mario Kart Wii than about what happened that night. Years passed by and the story sort of faded away. Now that I'm grown up though, I asked my neighbor cop what went down that night. There were rumors the guy had died. He said that night the man got a gun emptied into his skull and his wife was gravely wounded. She survived. Apparently, he was a drug lord that was going to make a deal with the police to turn in his rival gangs and some other people to the cops. The men in the van that were going door to door wanted to know where his kids and wife were to also shut them up, I guess. As for the kids, his oldest son was found dead a few hours away in a neighboring town. His car set ablaze. His other children are now living in other countries under witness protection programs. I just hope wherever Tiny is, she's doing okay, and the rest of her family got the help they needed. The police just left my home. A couple of months ago, while house-sitting and dog-sitting for my parents, I had an eerie feeling. As an obsessive ID channel watcher and younger female, I played it off as paranoia at first. During these few days, whenever I took the dog out, he'd suddenly begin sniffing around areas he never sniffed before, particularly under each of our windows. Thankfully, because of this, I discovered two large footprints under a window that looked directly into our living and dining room. Around this same time, about two months ago, I noticed a man walking up and down our street that I'd never seen in the entirety of my life. I lived in a small Midwestern town, so that was not a common experience. He also had, in my opinion, very odd mannerisms as well. Prolonged eye contact, continued staring and craning his neck as he walked by, and he never returned any of my smiles, hellos, or waves. Eventually, I became irritated due to how creeped out I was with both him and the eerie feeling in general, and decided to wave. Upon no acknowledgement in return other than a cold stare, I got up and acted like I was going to follow him down the street, which made him walk faster and turn a sudden corner, and never saw him again after that. Now today, I help my parents out by picking up their dog from the groomers, as it's right up the street and in a safe suburban area. Oftentimes, I don't lock while running errands in town. When I returned home with the dog, I had an unexplained horrible feeling the minute I walked in the door. Something, perhaps something as small as a blanket, seemed misplaced. I couldn't quite tell what it was, but something was definitely off. I threw a load of laundry on in the basement and quickly stood up and looked around. No one was there. Then I proceeded to the bathroom to check my makeup. Right then, I looked down to my left. There was feces in the toilet with no toilet paper and not flushed. I'd been the only one home all morning. I immediately threw back the shower curtain and started shaking from adrenaline. When I saw nothing was there, I closed the bathroom door and locked myself inside. I called dispatch and they arrived in less than two minutes. They searched the entire property and made me check my laptop to see if any recent search history wasn't my own. They also said to check the fridge to see if any food was missing. All valuables were accounted for in the end. I know it wasn't my feces because nobody in my family would take a shit like that and not use toilet paper or flush. 
I know someone had been there, yet because I love horror movies and the ID channel, everyone just tells me that I'm crazy. Nowadays, I keep my dad's hunting knife with me just in case. I was recently reminded of this story after telling it to some of my friends. This happened around 2011 or so, when I was still in high school. At that time, I really enjoyed PC gaming, and eventually started getting into a very specific MMORPG. I wasn't particularly good at it, but I wasn't playing to make friends or anything, only joining parties when absolutely necessary. For a few months, I just logged on and played some quests and did the normal stuff. Because it was so long ago, please excuse me if I can't remember all the game-specific terminology. Now, if I remember correctly, the game worked as follows. Some areas, like cities or towns, were public spaces. So when there, you would be able to interact with other people also currently there in their respective gameplay. If someone wasn't actually in your party, you would have not really any contact with them when entering into a private place from the outside. One day, when moving about in one of those public areas, I was approached by another player. We'll call him Andrew. He just started chatting with me. He was very friendly, and I didn't really sense any red flags. Honestly, it was a very standard interaction. Probably one of my first that wasn't only quest-related, though. He was very friendly and offered to help me with whatever I needed to do in-game next. At some point, he just randomly asked me whether I was really a girl. My avatar was female, but my username didn't really offer any information relating to my gender. I confirmed, albeit confused, that I was indeed a girl. For a while, that seemed to be it. We continued playing normally from there, did a bunch of quests together, and after adding him as a friend, I logged off eventually. Everything seemed perfectly fine with that interaction. A few days later, I played again with what I assume must have been newfound confidence in my friend-making skills thanks to friendly old Andrew. I did a quest with some other people who offered to let me join their guild. I was sort of stoked because I'd never had an offer to join a guild before. I immediately accepted and joined, even though it was tiny and unimportant. I was just happy to be there with other people. The next day, I logged in and saw Andrew was also online. The game publicly showed your guild affiliation. He was immediately very angry, I guess. He reprimanded me that I shouldn't just join any guild, and demanded I leave because he wanted me to join his instead. I was very confused about his strong reaction, but I felt like I must have somehow betrayed my friend. So I did as he asked and accepted his invitation to join his guild. I felt bad for just immediately dropping my previous one, though I did cheer up a bit when I noted that Andrew's guild was rated insanely high. The next time I logged in is where things started getting real weird. Just to clarify, I'd never exchanged any personal information with Andrew. All he knew about me was that I was a female. Not only did I value my privacy in-game, and never exchange personal information with anyone on there, I never posted on any public forum about the game, I never joined a group on social media related to it, and I hadn't even liked it on Facebook. As far as I know, there was really no way to link me to my account. I didn't even use the same username as my other accounts. I log in and Andrew greets me in the chat with my full name and surname. Now, my username was not related to my actual name, and I had never told him anything personal about myself, including my name. I was very confused. I assumed that perhaps since I hadn't been playing very long, I just hadn't totally understood the settings of the game. Perhaps my name was in an option available somewhere in the options menu. His messages became weirder and more invasive and sexual, though. I remember specifically him saying, I can't live not knowing what it feels like to touch your skin, followed by many messages of him speculating what I must smell like. I logged off and had no idea what to do. Being a stupid young person, I decided to try and freak him out, so I did some snooping of my own. I remember all I did was look up the guild's Facebook group. I think he was one of the admins. He was the leader, so it wasn't exactly hard to find him. At this point, I didn't know his full name yet either, but it was easy enough to figure out. Let's just say his username in-game was something like Anna Crew. 
just one letter off from the admin called Andrew. Next time I logged back in, he was online as well. Once again, he greeted me by my full name and surname, and some additional info this time as well. I responded with the same, since I now knew what his name and surname was as well. He was unfazed, though. He responded instead by asking me how things were in my neighborhood and at my school, specifically naming both of them. He knew where I lived and where I went to school, too, now. I immediately logged off, uninstalled the game, and never went back to it. I still don't know how he even got that information. It wasn't publicly available anywhere. I still have his full name and surname, and checked his Facebook out a while back out of sheer curiosity. Apparently, he's a professor at a university of science and technology. It's been long enough that I'm now ready to tell this story. Last year, I was dog-sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little bit skittish. I had work most of the week, so I was just living in the house for the time being. It was a nice house, not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped either. The only rooms I really used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest room. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this, I had two full days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift, because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings were always busy and nights were always slow. On weekends, people were more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was kind of having a nice time, actually. This day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week, one even involving a small fire. As the morning rush line was dwindling down, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view, and I started people watching a bit. As I slowly scanned the customers eating their bagels and reading the morning paper, my eyes met with a man on a laptop. He had long, dirty hair and a bit of stubble as well. He stared at me with a bit too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take very long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there, and he was still staring at me. Every now and then, he would look at his computer and then look back up at me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me, or like he could see every part of me. It was such an uncomfortable feeling that I went and cleaned the back of the restaurant instead, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break and sat far away from the man. He was out of my sight now, and I was out of his as well. When I came back from my break, the man was now gone. My manager asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but nothing else had really happened. She told me the man had been sitting there watching porn on his laptop the entire time and she had asked him to leave. That was weird enough already. This man had been watching porn and staring directly at me. I really wish this is where the story stopped. Hours passed by and the rest of the day was mostly normal despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge now. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I quite enjoy. I'm one of those weirdos that likes to clean. We're well in and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs, when my manager comes up to me once again. She informs me that the man has found his way back into the restaurant at some point. She found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. My manager knew that earlier that day he seemed to be paying special attention to me. She said that I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to, but afterwards strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She even offered to walk me to my car. I happily took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not too far away from work. It was about a five minute drive at most. This was helpful because then I didn't feel crippling anxiety for much longer. I got into the house, and after triple checking I had locked every door, I got into my pajamas. Unsurprisingly though, I was not ready to fall asleep yet. 
Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken, and the window had no curtains. This had me a little bit stressed. I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, though, which existed in the scary-looking basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sliding glass door facing some very dark woods. No thanks. I was sitting at the TV when the dog suddenly started growling. I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is very skittish, so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't even looking at him. I was muttering something like, shush, shush, and trying to figure out how to work the TV. The dog would not stop though and started to get even louder. I finally put down the remote and turned to face my dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window, and I could see an outline of a man in it, the exact same build as that guy at the restaurant. I screamed. Luckily, that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there frozen for a while. My dog had calmed down finally, but I hardly felt safe. I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife, and did what any responsible adult would do in this situation. I called my mommy. She did not advise calling the police. My mom never does. Instead, she came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt as well. I spent the rest of my time dog-sitting, clutching the knife anytime I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened after that, though. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he'd gone or even what he wanted with me. I'm glad, though, that he was a coward, and all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. Who watches porn in a sandwich shop, anyway? This happened in the fall, when my daughter was around eight years old. It was me, my husband, and daughter, who all lived in this relatively big house. We had planned on having a larger family, and eventually we did, hence why the house was so big in the first place. This house also had an unfinished basement. You couldn't enter the basement from inside the house, though. You had to go outside, and there was a door in the back of the house that led down into it. It wasn't really the best thing for storage or anything like that especially because it was susceptible to flooding as well. So we really didn't do much with all that extra space. Shelly, my daughter, would sometimes go down into the basement though. I guess she considered it like one of those child forts or something like that. We didn't really like this, obviously, and did our best to keep her out of there. But you know how children can be sometimes. If you forbid them to do something, it just makes them want to do it even more. So, we would catch her down there sometimes. And before you worry, there was nothing down there dangerous like tools or nails or anything like that. Other than a single empty shelf, there really was nothing at all down there. One day, while I was fixing up lunch, it was summer so school was out, Shelly came running into the house crying. I asked her what was wrong. She told me she had heard someone talking to her while she was in the basement. Apparently, the voice had told her to come out of the basement or it would come down and kill her. My next door neighbor, Janet, was over, so she watched Shelly as I went to see if anyone really was down there. As I looked down and searched that basement, though, there was absolutely nothing to be found. It was completely empty, so I chalked it up to just being Shelly's imagination. There was one good benefit, though, to what happened. Shelly was too scared to go down into the basement and didn't go down afterward for a very long time. Because of this, I put that whole incident of her hearing the voice out of my head. I had no reason to believe my daughter was in any danger now. This was months after this event. It was fall now, and Shelly was playing with Janet's son, who was around the same age as her. They were very friendly, but you know how children can be sometimes. Ben knew all about what had happened in the summertime, and he began calling Shelly a scaredy cat for what happened. Shelly did what most kids would do in that situation. 
She told Ben that if he was so brave, he should go down in that basement all by himself. And being a young boy, of course he decided that would be a good idea. Now, I have to mention that I did not hear any of this happening as it was going on. This is all what the kids told me afterward. If I had heard a single bit of this, I would have definitely put a stop to it right away. Anyway, where I come in, I was doing laundry or something, when I suddenly heard a scream coming from down in the basement. Completely terrified, I dropped what I was doing, sprinted outside, and noticed that the door to the basement was closed, and Ben was pounding on the door, begging for him to be let out. I simply turned the doorknob and the door opened normally. He sprinted out and ran past me over to his house. Going over to talk to Janet, Ben told us that he had gone down into the basement on a dare. He looked around a little bit until he heard a voice. The voice once again told him to leave the basement or it would kill him. According to Ben, he turned around and looked in the direction of that voice. Remember I told you about that one empty shelf? It was like a bookcase, sort of. He told us he'd seen a witch peeking out from behind the shelf, an old scraggly woman, and she was hiding behind it. I have to admit, his description of what he saw was pretty terrifying, but neither Janet or I actually believed a witch was behind the bookshelf. We left the kids at her house with her older daughter who was 16, and we both went over to investigate the basement ourselves. We looked behind this shelf, which was about six inches away from the wall, and of course we didn't see anyone. No human being could fit behind there, unless they were completely emaciated. So, Janet and I both chalked it up to our kids' imagination once again. Just to be safe though, we did put a padlock on the basement door to keep them from going down there anymore. I mean, sometimes children do have a tendency to scare themselves over nothing a bit. So, within about a week later, I was doing some homework when I began hearing some noises coming from within the basement. I was a little bit confused. There was no reason any sound should be coming from there. My husband was home and he heard it too. He grabbed up his gun and told me to wait in the house. As I was waiting, I could suddenly hear the sounds of a woman screaming and I was very shocked. I wanted to go outside, but I heard my husband yell for me to call the police. I dropped what I was doing and did just that. When the police finally got there, I watched as they led this really scraggly woman in handcuffs from my backyard to a police car. I was so confused until my husband explained to me that the woman was living in the crawl space underneath our house. The kids must have seen and heard her, and she'd hid in the space when we checked the basement out. I had never thought to check that crawl space because it was boarded off with just one trap door that was basically always closed. Well, when we had locked the door up, she had no way of getting out of the basement. I guess she needed to get out for food or something, I don't know. So when I heard all that noise, it was her trying to find a way out. My husband caught her and held her down screaming, while the police came quickly. I really didn't want to press charges against a woman who was homeless, and just wanted a place to stay. But then again, she did threaten my kid and my neighbor's kid too. Fortunately, she was placed in a psychiatric hospital instead. It seems she didn't actually want to hurt anyone, but she was clearly mentally unstable and needed a place to stay as well. I grew up in a very poor and very rural family, but even though my immediate family was pretty rural, it was nothing like Papa and Mama, the parents on my mom's side of the family. They lived pretty much in a cabin or a shack that only had two bedrooms. A lot of grandchildren would visit them, and we all slept in their huge feather bed whenever that happened. The walls were super thin, and there was basically no insulation at all in that house. This meant in the winter it was basically freezing in every room except the main one with a stove. We would huddle up in bed together covered with many various quilts. Getting to the house was a big journey in itself because they lived so far out into the hills. Eventually you even had to take a barely maintained dirt road to get all the way there. But don't get me wrong, I know I'm sort of making it seem like a bad thing but all us kids absolutely loved it. 
They had chickens and animals, and Papa was a hunter. It was a really, really nice and exciting time we spent out there. Now, I was about eight years old when I had a very strange experience at their home. There were three of us girls and some of our cousins who were going to spend some time over at their house. This was also in the fall though, so it was not going to be too hot or cold there yet. My parents dropped us off there and didn't remain too long before they left. We liked it though, and we were prepared to have a very good time. On the third night we were there, that was when the strange thing happened. It was nighttime, and we heard all of the chickens begin crying out. That was unusual for that time of the day slash night. Papa went outside to check them and see what was going on. At that very moment, the dogs began howling crazily too. They were in the backyard, but they were all leashed up in their dog houses. Papa came back in the house quickly, and he was very frustrated that all of the animals were acting up, and he couldn't get them to quiet down no matter what. He grabbed something and went back into the backyard. All of us kids were now worked up as well. Some of us were scared, but one of the boys saw something in the front yard. He and the other boys ran out to investigate. Me and the kids left behind followed shortly thereafter. The driveway to the old shack was pretty long. What we were seeing was something bright out on the dirt road. We had no idea what it was. We thought it might have been a ghost or something. But rather than being scared, we moved closer and closer to it. When we got close enough to make it out, it seemed to be a glowing cow or something. Papa and Mama came out into the front yard to see what we were doing. They all saw the glowing cow walking along the dirt road in front of the house. No one got close enough to touch it or interfere with it in any way. We just watched as this glowing animal walked down the road before we were all hurried back into the house. Papa thought someone was playing a joke on us by putting some sort of glow-in-the-dark substance on it or something, but that didn't explain why the chickens and dogs were so worked up and they stopped being that way immediately after the cow had left. I guess there were some boys who lived out there who might have done something like that if they could, and we just never found out. We never had that experience again either. We never saw that glowing cow and no one ever talked about it with us. Every single one of us saw it though, so we know that whatever it was, it definitely was real. I was used to being left home alone at a very young age. I don't even really remember how young I was when this started, but my parents were both working parents, and I was an only child, so it was just the way things were. There were rules about what I could do while I was home alone in order to not let people know I was. I always followed those rules down to the very letter because I had been doing them since I was so young. They sort of became second nature to me. When I finally had my own children, I had them follow different rules than I had if they were ever home by themselves. My parents always wanted me to make it look like there was no one in the house at all, so I always kept the lights out, the drapes closed, and I didn't answer the phone or door for any reason. I was 11 years old when this event happened that changed my perspective. I don't really remember what day it was exactly, I think it was one of those holidays that I got off school, but my parents still had to work. I was home by myself basically the entire day, and although it was bright early in the morning, around lunchtime, it began to get a little bit dark outside even then. I went out and looked to the window and saw that a huge storm cloud was moving in. I really liked those sorts of days, so I decided to go and fix me a big can of pasta have my lunch and watch the storm. While I was sitting there, I watched the lightning and listened to the thunder as it was getting closer and closer to the storm hitting. Normally, I would not be looking out the window while I was home by myself. It was one of those rules that I was generally pretty good about following. However, I loved storm watching so much that I just always had to watch them when they began rolling in, so that was the only rule I did occasionally break. Soon, the rain started to fall pretty damn hard, and the storm was out in full force. I can almost recall it like it was yesterday. 
It's so clear in my mind. The wind was pummeling the trees pretty hard. I even saw some objects being blown around in the wind too. At one point, a medium-sized trash can went soaring down the streets. Soon though, I saw the strangest thing. There was a man in a black raincoat or perhaps a trench coat, and he was simply walking down the street. I found this really weird because it was raining so hard and the wind was blowing fiercely too, not to mention just how dark it was outside now. I could only imagine he absolutely had to be out there for some reason because no one in their right mind would be walking around in that weather. I was so curious that I kept watching this guy as he was coming closer to the part of the street my home was on. I couldn't really make out any of his features because he was wearing a hat covering his face too. Another odd thing is that he wasn't carrying an umbrella with him, which seemed really weird given the circumstances. I did notice though that he kept looking from side to side as he walked down the street. It looked as if he was searching for something, like maybe he was looking for a certain address perhaps. While he was walking by my house, he turned his head and looked over in my general direction. When he did, I tried my best to hide myself behind the drapes, hoping he hadn't seen me. I knew that I should have kept myself hidden there, but I was too curious about him. I just had to look again. When I looked back out, I noticed the guy looked like he had hurt himself or something. He was crouched over, and it looked like he was holding his leg. There was a lot of debris blowing down the street, so I figured he must have gotten hit by a stray object. Now I was filled with a really bad choice. Normally when I was home alone I would keep the fact I was there alone a secret. But what if this guy had been seriously hurt by whatever had just struck him? He might need an ambulance or something. Plus I figured he may have already seen me when he looked over at the house. Maybe he would already figured out someone was there. I decided to go out and ask the guy if I needed to call an ambulance or something for him. It was still the middle of the day so I figured it would be safe doing so and I grabbed my umbrella and slipped my shoes on. I walked outside, closed the door behind me and very carefully walked out to where the guy was kneeling. I couldn't hear much of anything over the wind and storm so I had no idea if he was moaning or groaning in pain or saying anything at all. I walked up to him with the umbrella and put my hand out to tap him on the shoulder. Before I could actually do that though, he quickly lunged up at me and grabbed me by the arm. He stood up, and I realized he was not hurt at all. He must have seen me in the window of the dark house and assumed I was home alone. Pretended to hurt himself so I would go out and try to help, and stupidly I did. I began struggling, trying to get away from him, but I was just an 11-year-old kid who had no chance of overpowering a man of this size. I began desperately screaming for help, hoping that someone would hear me, since it was a day off from school. Then though, something really weird happened. I heard this really loud barking sound, and watched as out of nowhere, a German shepherd came sprinting across the street. It ran right up to the guy and bit him hard on the ankle. The man cried out when it happened and let go of me. I turned and ran into the house, slipping only once. I made it inside and locked all the doors and windows. I looked out the window quickly and noticed something else. There was a light on and a door was open on one of the houses that was across the street from me. Someone was standing in the doorway. I suppose it was a person who sicked the dog on the guy. The guy in the meantime was trying his very best to get away from that dog, but not having a good go of it. He was eventually able to free himself and run down the street. This was not before the police car sirens could be heard well on their way though. Turned out the lady who lived across the street was a teacher and had work off that day. She had heard me scream when the guy grabbed me, so she unleashed her dog on him. She may very well have saved my life that day. I was a bit of a freaked out kid when I was really young. Being an only child, I spent quite a lot of nights alone in my room, being scared of what was under the bed or what was in the closet or whatever. My family lived in an old house too, so it settled and creaked and moaned quite a bit at night. While I was young, I was really scared of all these noises in the dark. My parents would always explain to me that it was just the house and there was nothing at all to worry about. 
when I started to get older, I became really used to it. I also became a little desensitized to scary things, too. When I was really younger, I would watch a lot of scary movies and sometimes get really freaked out. I would turn off the light by the door and then run and jump into my bed. I was scared for quite a while that something would grab my leg if I went too slowly. But around the time I was 13 years old, I stopped being scared of things like that. I just sort of got used to the dark eventually, and it didn't scare me much at all. One thing, though, is that my parents wouldn't leave me home by myself at all when I was younger. If they were going somewhere, I would be going with them. If for some reason I could not go with them, I would be spending my time at a friend's house instead. This pretty much continued for most of my young life, all the way up until I was in my early teens. That was when my parents decided I was finally mature enough to begin staying home by myself. I guess the first time I stayed home by myself overnight, I could admit a lot of those childhood fears resurfaced a bit. I began to get creeped out by all the noises I had since grown accustomed to, and I started getting a little bit worried about things being under the bed or in the closet once again. It really wasn't that bad though, and it didn't last too long either. I was eventually just as accustomed to it when my parents were not home as much as I was when they had been home. When I was around 15, my parents were going to be away for an entire evening. They wouldn't be back until the following late morning. It was very cool for me because it was a Friday night, so I didn't have anything to do until the next morning. I'm not going to be cliche here. I didn't keep up all night watching horror movies or anything like that. I actually didn't become a fan of horror at all until recent years. Back then, I just kind of liked reading. So, after I had eaten, brushed my teeth, and everything like that, I went into my bedroom and settled in to read a good book. As usual, I began to hear a bunch of noises in the house, but I didn't let them bother me this time. After all, it was just the house settling, hearing what sounded like people walking around or things on the stairs and stuff like that was nothing out of the ordinary. It didn't really distract me at all from any of my reading. It was after a while while I was reading, though, that I began to see these flashes outside the window. I didn't normally follow the weather back then, so I had no idea a storm had been rolling in. Normally, I didn't spend a lot of time home by myself either when there was a storm, so I was a bit more freaked out than I normally would have been. Still though, I was not going to let this get me down. I had a good book going and I was having a very good read. What did pull me out of my book eventually though, was a sound unlike anything I had ever heard before. It sounded like a freight train was running through the neighborhood. I jumped up and ran over to the window to look outside. I didn't see whatever it was that was making the noise. In that moment, I flipped on the television in my bedroom to realize that there was a tornado warning in the area. I was freaked out. I assumed this must be the noise I was hearing. But as loud as this noise was, I calmed down and realized it couldn't have been that close or the TV would not be working still. I decided maybe it was time to take shelter down in the basement though. I went out into the hallway over to the stairs. I was walking around in the dark, like I told you I was used to doing. I wasn't going to go down the stairs in the dark though. I flipped the switch on to turn the light at the bottom of the stairs. When the light came on, the strangest thing happened. I heard someone exclaim something from in the living room. Holy shit! Or something like that. I stopped at the top of the stairs. Despite the noise of the storm, I was able to hear someone was actually down in my living room and must have sprinted out of the room. For the first time, really being scared, I turned around and went back to my bedroom. I went in and locked the door. I didn't have a phone in my room though, so I couldn't call 911 or anything. All I could do was hide in my closet and hunker down in there until the storm began dying down. I'm not sure how long I stayed in there in the end. Obviously, the tornado did not hit my house, and it calmed down long before I even considered coming out. But I kept hearing the noises of the storm, mixed with the noises of the house, and I couldn't tell whether it was innocuous or whether whoever had broken into my home was still there making these sounds. It was much later when I finally got brave enough to come out again. When I did, I crept through that house, trying to see what was going on. 
It was scary as hell going downstairs, but I was able to manage to do it. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised to not find anyone inside the house. I mean, they seemed quite alarmed when the light came on and probably had been gone ever since then. But there were many clear signs of a break-in inside the house downstairs. This story is perhaps more uncomfortable than it is necessarily scary. Growing up, and probably all the way through my 20s, I believed in a lot of metaphysical things. I believed in ghosts, psychics, tarot cards, you name it. I don't really believe in any of that nowadays, but when I was younger, you couldn't convince me these things didn't exist. When I was 26, though, I had a really horrible experience. It was a bunch of drama that I really don't want to go too deep into. However, as I tried to move past it, I began seeing that it affected the rest of my life pretty badly. Basically, an ex of mine was very fascinated with a guy who liked me, so they spread some rumors and lies about the guy in order to keep me away from him so my ex could try and have him instead. It all backfired when out of concern I told the guy who liked me what had been said. He didn't believe me and I got completely ostracized from my entire group of friends. It was terrible. I tried to move on and meet some new people, however, that was not exactly going very easily. I met some new guys and went on some dates, but everything seemed to always end in a very similar way. My brain at the time noticed these patterns and tried to put a story behind them. I started to genuinely believe I was cursed or something similar. So of course, what do you do when you're cursed? I decided to go see a psychic. I didn't know what to expect because I had never really been to one before. I myself was a reader of tarot cards though, so I pretty much knew what all the cards stood for, how to lay them out, and how to read them as well. I don't know the exact ethnicity of the old fortune teller I eventually went to, but she was very old, and she had a very strong accent as well of some sort. I went in and made a pretty stupid mistake right off the bat. I told her everything that had been going on in my life, and how things had been really bad. I wondered if she could tell me why things were going so badly, and what I could do in order to make them go right again. Well, obviously, in hindsight, my first mistake was giving her way too much information. She began reading my tarot cards, and while she did, I realized she was completely making everything up as she went along so it would fit the story I'd told her. Of course, I felt really bad and realized she was not going to try and help me in any way. She told me, though, that there were two people who were really against me, and they had put a sort of spell on me. She told me she couldn't reveal who they were just yet, but she could cast a counter spell or something that would be able to revert this curse. She went into this speech about all these candles she would have to burn that would cost $750 to do. Of course, she would have done it for free, she claimed, if it wasn't for those oh-so-special candles. There was no way I was going to do that, of course. I mean, I had simply gone there for a psychic reading. I didn't have $750 to just throw away. There was something about this woman, though, that kept me from just saying no and going this weird overbearing presence that I was sort of intimidated by. Eventually, after a long bit of uncomfortability, I was able to finally get away by telling her I had the money stored at home and would return with it later. I don't think she believed me, but I still managed to get out and succeeded. So what makes this story uncomfortable then? Not long after, I got a message from the guy I told you about earlier. He told me he was dabbling a bit in the occult at the time, and was so upset by what had happened, he went to a psychic and had them put a curse on me. He apologized profusely for that. I asked him about the psychic he went to, and he told me it happened to be the very same woman I had gone to see as well. Apparently, when she heard my story, she was well aware I was the person that guy had wanted to put the curse on. For a moment, I genuinely believed in curses, but I guess it was just a scam and she was trying to fleece me out of money or something. When I was a kid, my parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles were a lot different than parents seem to be today. 
we would just be sent outside to play at even really young ages without any supervision at all. This happened all the time, especially when we would be visiting my grandma's house. She lived out in the country too, so we were used to going out and playing hide and seek or doing whatever in the woods. When I was like 9 years old I think, my grandma actually began seeing a guy who lived even further out into the country than she did. He didn't even have a working bathroom in his house, instead there was an outhouse outside. I always remember him claiming all the way until the day he died that he had never once used an inside toilet his entire life. The house he lived in up in the middle of nowhere was this really small shack. We were only there to visit and at night we would go back to my grandma's actual house in order to sleep while she and he stayed there. The reason I bring this up is because of just how rural it was. It was literally one of those cabins in the woods you would see from horror type movies. This event happened my very first time out visiting there. While I was used to the woods that surrounded my grandma's house, I was not at all familiar with this particular area. As normal, my family always felt that the kids should go outside and play, so they sent us out on our own. Three of my cousins and I went out to explore this new area. We had gotten pretty far away from the house when we decided to go and play some hide and seek. When I was off to hide, I found myself a very good hiding spot, behind a rock that was jutting out from the side of a hill. It was a pretty ingenious spot and I knew no one would ever be able to find me. Well, I was right. I was under that rock for a very long time, just waiting and waiting for someone to show up, but no one did. After waiting and waiting even longer, I finally decided to climb out from under the rock and see just what was going on. I couldn't find any of my cousins. I kept walking around, calling out for them. However, I didn't get an answer from a single one of them. I didn't begin panicking yet though, even though I was starting to get a little bit scared. I figured if I couldn't find them, I would just head back to my grandma's boyfriend's shack. And yes, if you're wondering, saying grandma's boyfriend does sure sound weird as heck. I began heading back to the shack, or at least I thought that I was heading back there. I don't know how long it had taken us to get to the area we were playing hide and seek in, but after a while, I realized it was taking me a lot longer than that to get back. It had been late afternoon when we headed out, and it was in the fall, so it was beginning to get dark outside too. That finally got me starting to panic a little bit. I kept trying to find my way back, but the more and more I did, I just kept getting myself more and more lost. The fact the sun was now setting was scaring me even more. It wasn't very long at all until it was completely dark outside, and I was super duper lost. If you've never been out in the woods in the dark, it's hard to imagine just how scary it really is. At nine years old, it was the most terrifying thing in the world. Every little noise was scary, trying to figure out what it could be. A child's imagination is so much more vivid than an adult's, and it comes up with the worst ideas it can as well. If I knew then what I know now, I would have stopped just wandering around in the dark. I was just getting myself more and more lost. I kept hoping to hear my parents' voices calling out for me or something. I kept on telling myself if I just kept walking, I would eventually make it back to the shack. Wandering in the dark, I was extremely hungry and thirsty now. I was only finally able to get some water to drink when I stumbled across a creek. I was used to drinking from creeks like this, so I drank up quite a bit. I also had not come across a creek before on the way there, so I knew I must be much more lost than I initially thought I was. Not knowing what else to do, I began to follow this creek. I figured it must lead somewhere which in retrospect doesn't really make too much sense, but I didn't know what else to do. After a while though, I thought I saw something up ahead of me. Although it was dark out, the moon was pretty full, so I did have at least some light. That also made it easier to see up ahead. There was something sitting by the creek ahead of me. As I got closer, I began to notice it seemed to be a person, a really raggy person, wearing a coat or perhaps something with a long hood. I considered walking up to this person and asking him if he could help me find my way back to my grandma's boyfriend's house, 
but he was also a stranger, and I was taught I was not supposed to talk to them. While I was wondering just what to do, he stood up suddenly. He must have noticed me behind him, because he began walking in my direction. More so, it seemed like he was limping as he was coming as well. I didn't know how to react to this situation. I just kind of stood there in fear. He came closer and closer to me, and I got my first good look at him. He had his hood on, but he had a lot of really long, ratty, and matted hair as well. His skin was very white, and I could see various cracks in it as he got closer to me. About ten feet away, I finally heard him talk. Little boys shouldn't be out in these woods so late at night, you know. You never know what might get ya. It was terrifying. My body took over and I took off, running back into the woods away from the creek. The man was pretty decrepit, so it was easy enough to outrun him. I didn't even look behind me to see if he was trying to catch me. I just ran and ran. I did lose the guy in the end, but now I was even more lost myself. I was scared even more with every little noise that I heard. At the very least, I was headed in the opposite direction of the creek, which had to be leading me back to the shack, surely. I'll cut to the chase, though. After an hour or so of retreating away from this creek, I noticed some lights up ahead. I also heard someone calling out my name. It was my dad, and he was out searching for me with my grandma's boyfriend. I ran up to them, basically crying my eyes out. I was just happy to be found. To this day, I've never had a scarier experience. I told everyone about what I had seen. My grandma's boyfriend told me he thought he might knew the guy that I described to him. Apparently, he was an old guy who lived even further into the woods than this guy did. There were a lot of stories about him doing some pretty horrible and illegal things. He'd even been suspected of abducting a kid about 30 years prior. He was never charged with anything, though, because the kid was never found. That's the time when he moved out into the middle of nowhere. Very few people ever see him or have any contact with him. I do find it weird that they would have told me these things at nine years old. But I guess this was a different time and they were different people. But yeah, that old man was my boogeyman for a whole lot of years. I truly do not know how to explain what happened here. I can only tell you what occurred. I have problems sleeping very often, and I tend to wake up immediately as the sun comes up. Although I have blinds on my windows, I think everyone knows they mostly do very little to keep the room from getting very bright. So, in order to be able to sleep in if I need to, I sleep in a canopy bed. For those of you who might not know what that is, it's basically a bed frame with curtains on it. I pull the curtains, which on my bed are pretty heavy, so when the sun comes up, it remains relatively dark on the bed. I always sleep with those curtains drawn without exception. This just happened to me a few days ago. I was alone in bed, mostly because I live alone anyway. This was one of those nights where I was having a hard time falling asleep. I was just lying there, trying to get my mind to think of something light or funny, because that's generally what I do to go to sleep. I don't know exactly how long I was lying in bed. I sleep on my side, too. From behind me, I could hear a whispering, almost a hissing-type voice saying, Get up! Get up! Get up! A shock went through my body, and I sat straight up in bed. I turned to the direction that the voice had come from, but of course, with the curtains on the bed closed, I was not able to see anything at all. I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. I had very clearly heard someone in my room, and whoever it was sounded crazy. I had no way to tell where the person who had whispered at me could have been in my room. I don't know how long I sat there in the bed, waiting to see if I would hear another noise or something. If someone was moving around in my bedroom, it should have been quiet enough for me to hear it but I couldn't hear anything. I was too scared to open the curtain and look around, because again, I didn't want to know what I would find. My bed was up against the wall. I scrunched back up against it, as I listened to see if whoever was in my room would say anything else. But no matter how much time passed, I did not hear a single thing. 
Finally, I decided I needed to go look around my house to see if anyone was actually there. I had an old baseball bat in my room, so I picked that up and started searching through my home. I didn't find anyone in the house, though. I did notice that my basement door to the outside was unlocked. I promptly locked it and checked all of the windows in the house to make sure they were locked as well. I have no real idea if anyone was actually there. I have no idea who or what was whispering at me, but I do know that that experience only made it even more difficult for me to go to sleep. It's been several days since then, and I've not had an experience like this since. When I was 16, I was allowed to drive around the extra car, and of course, I spent this time driving around with my friends as much as possible. I was also allowed to stay out a lot later than normal, and was given a bunch of other freedoms around that time as well. I was driving home on a Friday night once. It was pretty late, and when I got to the house, it was pretty dark. I was an only child. My parents hadn't told me where they were going that night but they were obviously not home when I arrived. I hit the button to open up the garage and pulled into it. As I did, though, I noticed some movement in the corner of the garage. After my eyes started to adjust, I noticed that there was someone in the garage, hiding in the corner. Someone had broken into our house and was hiding in the garage. That was the only explanation. The door was halfway down at this point. I hit the button to have it open back up, I was terrified and waited for it to be high enough for me to pull out of the garage. When it was, I pulled out as fast as I could and rushed down the street. I knew where the police station was, so I drove directly there. They drove out to the house while I waited there at the station. The guy was of course not at the house still, but they did pick him up in the end. He had some items on him he'd stolen from our house. He had also been in jail before for assault, I found out. I couldn't help but thinking after what might have happened if I hadn't noticed that man hiding in the garage. What would have happened if I had just gotten out of the car with the intruder lurking there in the dark behind me? I have no idea, but I'm sure I was very lucky that I did notice him. During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. As horrible boyfriends tend to be in the beginning, he was loving, attentive, charismatic, and seemingly a very normal partner. He made me personal mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and even dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. I, young, foolish, and naive, was deeply smitten by his mysterious, dark, and artistic allure. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering severe delusions. He would compulsively lie and started creating art that focused heavily on themes of rape and murder. I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my very best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed he shouldn't have to struggle with this mental illness alone. One time, he vanished without a trace for an entire day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone still on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had involuntarily been checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my gentle, intelligent, and normal, albeit somewhat depressed boyfriend, surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. I mean, for real, the place was like something out of a horror movie. In retrospect, None of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence he was cheating on me, and secretly relieved I confronted him. 
I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked in that moment. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new persona, one with dead, wild animal eyes. He threatened to kill himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I just called the police instead. They weren't much help, of course, but Tim did leave after that. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again. He would leave me insane voicemails, though, from different numbers every time, for weeks and weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken, though, and things eventually returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds now. He was clearly manic and posting a newly written song all over social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. I won't copy and paste them here because they'll lead back to his band camp, but I knew immediately the song was pretty explicitly about my rape and murder, but in a clever, disguised way. A catchy way too, apparently. The bastard. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account. He was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them all about me. They flip-flopped between flowery love prose and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern, but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it would be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough from first glance, until I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio searching for me. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office. I slammed the door and unleashed upon her what must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely even speak. Nancy, though, for her part, was amazing. She understood everything almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed the report. My co-workers later told me Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. Well, he was not a designer. He had brought with him a fake portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded completely legit. At the end of his interview, he'd even casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song just for me. It had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my co-workers to let me know with warmest regards. And that phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced around it in circles until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he was not enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day, but the incident did help me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too, luckily. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio. The CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, though, I moved to a different city, and that was that. I haven't heard from him since. I discovered the most alarming part later, though. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown. When we compared notes much later, she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the very same week it had all gone down. She was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hid it while he didn't know. Tim was so angry when he found out, he completely trashed their entire house and never came back. If all our timelines are correct, that must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. So this story might not really be as spectacular as some of the other ones you've heard, though it was disturbing enough that I remember the event in vivid detail. It is somewhat long, but I'll try to condense it to the point it doesn't bore anyone or anything. The cast is myself, my sister S, 
and the older dude, Carl. It's not his real name, but it will be used for the sake of this story. This happened when I was around the age of 14 to 15. I had gone to a theme park, Great America, I think, when my older sister was around the age of 17 or 18. S pestered me to go onto a ride with her that I was not comfortable riding at the time. Finally, after a bunch of bugging though, I budged and said I'd go with her. While we stood in line, S and I heard Carl yelling about his favorite sports teams to seemingly nobody. He was with a group of girls, so we assumed he was just having a good time with his friends, but apparently that was not the case. Anyway, S and I got on the ride from start to finish. The ride itself was like a pirate ship that basically swung back and forth similar to a pendulum and eventually started to do complete circles, causing passengers to temporarily hang upside down. The ride itself is not really key to the story, beside the fact that it made me extremely nauseous afterwards. After the ride had finished, I noticed that the girls that were previously with Carl had left him while screaming that he was a weirdo. I didn't really pay that much attention to them. My stomach was seriously acting up. I guess I should have though. At the time, S and I were standing on top of a bridge, and I told S I needed a minute to recompose myself. I walked over to the railing of the bridge and leaned over to breathe some fresh air while trying my best not to puke. Basic breathing stuff, really. This is where the story gets weird. While I'm leaning over this railing, I suddenly feel these huge arms wrap around my waist, and then I'm hoisted up into the air. Initially, I'm freaking out trying to comprehend what the hell is actually happening to me in that moment. All I really knew is that now I was in the air, and I was not exactly sure why. I thought whoever was holding me up was going to throw me over the bridge, but instead they put me down on the ground after a moment. I instantly whipped around, only to see Carl there smiling at me. S ran over to stand beside me, and asked Carl why he just yanked me up into the air, I was still in a state of shock at the time and couldn't speak. The following conversation ensued. Why the hell did you pick him up? Oh, well, you know, he looked sick and like he might need some fresh air. Tell me how exactly lifting someone into the air is going to help with a sickness. Carl ignored the question and stared at me, asking me how I was doing. I ignored him in turn and looked away from him, since my sister was now doing all the talking. Come on, kid. Look at someone when they speak to you. You bored or something? I bet you're bored going on rides with your... Uh, sister, friend, sibling. Eh, doesn't matter. I heard her screaming her lungs out on that ride we all just went on. I bet she doesn't want to go on any of the more scary ones. Yeah, she's no fun. You'll probably have to go home soon because of her. Note my sister had been screaming a lot on the ride. She told me she screams on rides because it raises her adrenaline levels, causing her to have more fun or something. Leave him alone. What we're doing is none of your business. Oh, but it is. I want everyone that comes to this park to have a great time. I mean, it's great America after all. Tell you what, kid. How about you and I go to the water park and ditch your little friend here? She's not going to have much fun getting wet anyway. But trust me, we will. We can both go on all the water rides that you want, and afterwards I can take you out and grab some lunch, maybe. I don't know what you all think about an old random man asking a 14 to 15 year old to go out with him, but I instantly thought this dude was trying to kidnap me. I felt this guy was a danger to myself and possibly S as well, so I made a movement to walk away from him. Carl subtly stepped in front of me to block my path of exit, so I had to think of another way we could get past him. I feigned getting a phone call from my parents. Hi, Mom? Oh yeah, my sister and I were just getting off the pirate ship ride. Wait, you're waiting right outside the ride near the food court? Okay, my sister and I will meet you there right now then. See you soon. I said it in a loud enough voice that Carl could hear everything that transpired, and with newly found confidence I pushed right past him. S and I walked away from Carl in the direction that my feigned mother was apparently waiting. After we walked for about 10 to 15 seconds, we both broke out into a sprint until we reached the park entrance. We tried to tell the front desk people about the guy, but they said since nothing actually happened, they couldn't really do anything.
So, a little bit of background here. My father was in the army for 21 years, retired and moved to a very small town in central Florida. He got bored after a couple of years, and even though we didn't need the money between his retirement and what mom was making as a bookkeeper slash tax prep, he wanted to go back to work. He started working at various gas stations, and it being a small town, the owners wouldn't care much if I came there and helped him out with stocking the coolers or even running the register, as long as I didn't sell any beer or smokes. This all took place in the late 80s and early 90s. The actual story I'm going to tell took place in 1990, and I remember the date well because it was shortly after my birthday. Being 15 in Florida, I had just gotten my learner's permit. My dad would let me drive him to and from work just to get some experience on the road, both at day and at night. I was sitting in my usual spot at a table that was set up along the windows, book in hand, feet propped up, and a Mountain Dew on the table along with some snacks. I would generally spend most of the evening that way, reading books, getting up to run the register and stock the cooler at different times. I remember at one point glancing up because something had caught my attention that was unusual. I realized a lady was walking up our parking lot from the direction of the interstate. This in and of itself was really strange. Where we're located, you don't exactly get many people walking, and definitely not coming from the direction of that interstate. I figured she must have broken down somewhere and was coming to use the phone for a tow truck call or something. I was completely wrong. She came into the store and looked around for a few minutes. I remember immediately getting a strange and creepy feeling from her. She walked right up to the counter and started telling my dad a story about how she'd gotten stranded and needed a ride up to the next big town up north from us. Ocala was the town. This is important. My dad let her know that he was working, and there was no way he could take her at the moment. Instead, she turned and looked at me. While she was looking away from him, my dad caught my eye and suddenly shook his head no. I was confused for a second. Then she turned back to my dad and pointed at me, asking if I could take her instead. My dad responded back I had only just gotten my learner's permit. I wouldn't be able to drive her anywhere and then drive back. Now normally I would have done it even though it was illegal, because I'd done it a few times before already. I didn't argue with my dad though, since this was completely out of character for him. He was normally very chatty with the customers, but for whatever reason he was extremely dismissive and almost curt with this one. Turns out he'd gotten a bad vibe about her from the minute he'd seen her walking up the drive. Well, she cussed at him for a minute, and he basically told her to get the fuck out the store. She slammed the door open. I thought the glass was going to break from how hard she slammed it. She then walked out of the store and down the driveway. I kept a close eye on her and watched as she made her way back up to the interstate, then walked up the northbound on-ramp. Almost a year passed by, and I'm in my bedroom less than a week before my 16th birthday. I hear my dad suddenly yelling from the living room, Son, get your ass in here and look at this! I quickly ran into the living room and saw my dad pointing at the TV. I looked at the mugshot of the lady up on the screen and immediately recognized the lady who had been in the store that night. Turns out I'd almost given a car ride to Eileen Warnos, who was later convicted of being a serial murderer and later put to death. Still gives me nightmares about what could have happened. 